Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar. I'm Amy Miller, the Federal Grant Administrator at the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, or OPR. OPR is the state's comprehensive planning agency, and one of our many responsibilities is to provide resources and assistance on all aspects of federal grants. We serve as the state's single point of contact for the Intergovernmental Review of Federal Programs under the Executive Order, or EO 12372. And we hold trainings like this one to encourage and improve the ability of people and organizations in California to pursue and manage federal grants. You can find many more resources like this at the OPR website under the link for federal grants. There you'll find the online portal to comply with the EO 12372 process, along with a page full of federal grant resources like other trainings, reports, websites, and many other tools. Here you can also sign up for the Federal Grants Update eList, a weekly email newsletter highlighting the new federal grant opportunities, federal funding news, and training events. And before I turn things over to our presenters, I'd like to share a short disclaimer that the following presentation does not constitute legal advice and does not necessarily represent the views or endorsement of OPR, but is provided as a service to the grants community. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our presenters from Cl Clifton Larson Allen, or CLA. CLA is a professional services firm with one of the largest governmental audit and consulting practices in the country, serving more than 3,700 governmental clients nationwide. CLA performs the largest number of single audits in the United States, auditing over $50 billion in federal funds annually. They have more than 120 offices in the United States including 10 here in California. We're thrilled to have them here with us today. And so with that, I'll turn things over to Sean and Hannah. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, welcome to our, our uh, webinar today. We appreciate everyone attending. Um, as we will go through, we also have another um, you know, slide here regarding that this is not a same thing as uh, Amy had mentioned before, this is not legal advice. Um, but what we wanted to walk through today with you is to look at what the most recent Treasury guidance um, that came out with the final rule release described and some of the common practices with grants management, identify the eligible use of funds, and talk about some compliance issues and some common pitfalls. Um, so we're going to go through a brief Introduction and background, we'll walk through the various eligible expenditure categories um, or ECs that uh, have come out with the most recent guidance. And then we will have a brief discussion on capital expenditures. And um, if we have some time for some Q and A's, we'll, we'll walk through those. So first on a background with ARPA, ARPA was signed into law March 11th, 2021. And um, with this was released $350 billion of funding for state, territories, tribal, and local governments to respond to the pandemic. Um, the interim final rule came out shortly after um, and outlined some of the um, allowable uses and the revenue loss calculation. Um, on January 6, 2022, the final rule came out. Um, it clarified prior guidance, made a few changes, um, made, uh, we'll go through a couple of the biggest changes, including the revenue loss uh, calculation, but it really was clarifying most of the prior guidance um, and then has actually some Q and A's that you go through. We, we do have a hyperlink in, in here um, if you download these slides later for the Treasury. Um, otherwise, you can also just um, Google treasury.gov uh, final rule and it should pop right up for you. The final rule is um, 437 pages long, I believe. So it is quite a bit of information um, to go through. Um, so one thing to just kind of add as uh, there is a um, on that same final rule page on the Treasury site, there is also an overview of the final rule, which we also have a hyperlink on here as well. Um, the overview is a really good summary. Um, I believe it's 44 pages long, so much easier to digest. It does have a good summary of the various categories and expectations. So I would encourage you to um, have that at pretty ready, easy access as you're walking through these grants. Um, the Treasury has also released several versions of their compliance and reporting guidance. Um, there was, the newest one came out, I believe, February 28th, uh, where they did change some of the expenditure categories or ECs um, of what they had done before those went into effect as of 
um, the April 1st of this year. So any uh, reports going forward after April 1st, you will be required to use those expenditure categories. Um, they also released an user guide for the project and the expenditure report recently. So we do have links to all of those as well. And then just to kind of talk through a couple of the um, high level considerations as you are um, looking at setting up these funds and how to account for them. Uh, one of the biggest pieces is how are you going to track and monitor your expenditures in your financial system? Whatever that, um, whatever system you're using um, is looking at what your capacity is. Um, the long story short is when you're reporting to treasury, you have to report at a project base level. So if you can, within your current chart of account system, first set aside a separate fund just for the ARPA funds to, um, it would be a special revenue fund or grant fund, um, set up a separate fund, set up separate accounts for each project uh, at whatever you know segment level that you're able to do that within your chart of accounts. Um, that way, when you go to do your reporting, you can run a report out of the system. It's mu it'll be much easier when you go through the audit process as well. And it'll just make your reporting a lot easier down the road. Yeah, and Hannah, just to highlight that point too. So Hannah and I have done a few reportings so far for some of our, some of our larger tier clients that were due in January. Uh, certainly having a report that you can generate based on a project code will save you tons of time on the back end and pain and suffering while trying to do these reports on a quarterly or annual basis, depending upon what tier level you are. Yep, exactly. Thank you, Sean. Um, we do have listed here, and I've been told by our uh, friends in single audit that it's no longer being called a CFDA number, but um, it is the uh, the coding for the ARPA grant is 21.027. Um, kind of going along with what we talked about on the general ledger fund um, setup, part of the reason that it's important to have that differentiation is when you are doing your reporting, there are now 83 subcategories. Um, it's expenditure categories uh, that you will have to be reporting to the Treasury um, on a project based level. If you have any projects that are probably, um, you know, could be multiple categories, if they're all encompassing and can encompass more than one category, then, you know, just pick which one you want to assign it to and do that. But if it is truly part of it is one subcategory, part is another, you're going to have to break it up into two separate projects and you'll need to be able to track the expenditures and the usage of those funds separately. Because when you do report it to the treasury, it is on a project um, specific basis. Uh, so the other thing just to help you down the road when it comes to reporting time is that we have found it to be very important for our clients is to number one, prepare early, um, get things set up before you start spending. This is a long-term grant fund. It is a long-term project. Um, it can go through 2024 for um, obligated amounts and then 2026 for actual expenditures. So there is a lot of time here. So, we, you know, don't, not feeling the need to hurry up and spend the funds. Um, make sure and set up a process up front, get things prepared. And then most importantly is to have a central repository for reporting and for documentation. That will save you a lot of headache down the road when it's time to do the reporting and also um, for your single audit. So what, uh, one of the other big considerations um, to think about as you're looking at projects and how do we wanna spend this money is, are we gonna spend this on inter internal projects um, within the city or town or state or county, um, or are we going to um, do inter um, external recipients like um, not-for-profits, uh, perhaps a food bank, um, some of these other groups? Because if you're doing external and working with other organizations, you have to think about the, the sub-recipient monitoring, risk assessments, um, and ongoing reporting that's going to be required for working with the sub-recipient. Um, and then making sure that they understand the federal procurement guidelines and the rules uh, for running a federal grant as well. So just something to think about when you're looking at structuring how you're going to do these programs. Um, the other thing is really documenting the project ap approval process, and that goes to that um, planning early, is who's going to be the ultimate approval for each project, whether that might be your mayor, your um, town manager, city manager, whatever that level, CEO kind of level of um, your entity is, somebody centrally needs to be doing that official approval, um, something we have found with some of the prior um, 
COVID related grants that encompassed multiple departments was that there wasn't necessarily one central place that was monitoring the funding available, the, um, you know, who was approving what projects. Uh, for instance, on the CARES fund, you know, we had quite a few um, clients that ended up overspending their CARES funding because that, you know, multiple depart departments were just going out and spending the funds and there wasn't this good project approval process. So this is very important from the beginning to get that set up, have a documented process, have an application process. Um, for the departments to go through if they want to utilize any of these funds. And Hannah, to your point too, from what we learned, we learned a lot through CARES, right? CARES was initially kind of pushed out. I don't want to say quickly, but I mean, we were all in the middle of the pandemic. It, it had just kind of started and two months in, the, the states, cities, towns got a tremendous amount of cash flowing their way with a short amount of time to spend. Um, I think from our perspective, that certainly led a lot of clients to uh, quickly jump on the ball, if you will, and start spending, maybe lacking some controls, maybe lacking some oversight. So because this program is so much longer and so much more uh, cumbersome than CARES, we certainly recommend a full approval process. And in terms of gathering project support up front, um, Hannah and I do outsourcing consulting for our state and local government clients. I can't tell you the amount of retirements, early retirements, people leaving from one community to another, um, just over the past 12 to 18 months. So if you don't get this information up front and you don't plan for this approval process up front, it will again cause you headaches down the road. Uh, two years from now when the auditors come in to do a single audit or if you need to report something for the feds and they have a question, if you weren't the person doing the work at the time and there's no central repository, good luck finding that support years down the road. Right. Yeah, great point, Sean. And that goes right into that last bullet on there. Gathering, it's we found it to be very important, number one, for determining the eligibility of a project to have the supporting documentation up front, but also, um, you know, many, uh, many of the, the NEUs who receive less than $10 million of funds are only going to be reporting on an annual basis. And so, you know, a year from now, after this project has started and started um, gathering expenses and such, and it's time to report, if you have additional reporting items that you have to do on that project in the Treasury's portal, but the person's no longer there, or they can't find the information, or they've forgotten, or someone's retired, um, that will make it much more difficult for doing that required reporting to the Treasury. So you want to get all of the information that you need to support the project and the eligibility up front from the beginning. And that includes not only financial data, but also programmatic data. Depending upon what expenditure category you select, there could be additional components to that that you need to report on, whether it's a, an FTE count or um, some other kind of logistics in terms of physically where you spent that money. So something to think about, too, going forward here. Yep, absolutely. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean to walk through the public health expenditure category. Excellent. Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you for the intro. Um, public health is the, the first ARPA bucket, if you will, the, the first expenditure category. So this is just a snippet from the feds. And of course, with everything federal, we had to make changes during the middle of our, of our reporting here. And previously they had the EC, the expenditure categories <clears throat> listed here. Then I believe it was February, they changed it based on the final rule. So now you have your new expenditure category listings. And the feds try to break this down into four main areas from a public health perspective, which are COVID-19 mitigation and, and prevention, medical expenses, behavioral health, you know, mental health, those types of costs, and also preventing responding to violence. So out of these four buckets, COVID-19 mitigation prevention, we sort of look at it like CARES-like, right? So a lot of those same categories, expenditure categories, they have been present under CARES. <clears throat> Things such as uh, COVID-19 testing, uh, prevention, et cetera. But then they opened it up even further to these other categories. So let's go into those a little bit here. As I started to talk about for COVID-19 mitigation prevention, enumerated eligible uses include, so enumerated means that the final rule has called these out. So essentially, if the final rule is spelling out that you can use these types of categories, it is a, you know, quote unquote, guarantee that they are eligible for this program. So as I started to talk about vaccination programs, testing, treatment, um, even temporary medical facilities too, you know, depending upon if there's, there's big spikes within COVID-19. And then after the COVID-19 mitigation prevention, we're talking about medical expenditures that are enumerated. 
Uh, this could be reimbursed, reimbursed expenses for medical care for COVID-19 testing. Um, cert, uh, certainly family paid and medical leave for public employees because of COVID-19. And also treatments of long-term sim symptoms and effects of COVID-19. Uh, I know myself personally, I've had a few clients who have been out for months um, because they were either older or more susceptible to, for COVID-19. Um, and, and instead of you know, utilizing their entire sick bank, um, this is a way to help pay for some of that, that cost. Behavioral health care, uh, I know this is near and dear to Hannah and I's hearts. Um, we've seen a lot of this, whether it's from work or family-wise, where the pandemic certainly wreaked havoc on people's behavioral and mental health. So ARPA is allowing, and the Treasury is allowing, for you to respond for prevention, outreach, outreach treatment, uh, inpatient treatment, schools, right? I know Hannah has kids in school and, you know, Everyone could use a little bit more mental health at their school systems. And I don't know how California is, but here in Massachusetts, uh, budgets are tight. So here's a great way to supplement a school budget and get more behavioral health services in there. Preventing and responding to violence, um, something I actually never really thought about um, until ARPA came out in one of these subcategories that they put for this expenditure piece. Uh, refers to trauma recovery services, uh, community violence intervention programs, mm -hmm. And also for communities that are experiencing perhaps higher gun violence through the pandemic, these are all ways in which ARPA can be used to help these situations that may be occurring in your community. With that, I will turn it back to Hannah so we can talk about the negative economic impact and public health negative economic impact sections of ARPA. Thank you, Sean. One thing to just mention um, about the public health and going into negative economic impact is that with the um, updated reporting guidance that came out in February, they did pull out the capital expenditure piece, which we will go into in a little more detail. Um, prior to that, there were some enumerated uses and expenditure categories specific for capital type projects. And what they did was they said, you know what, we're just gonna say for these two categories, which are not necessarily um, always capital in nature, um, like the, the broadband and the water sewer infrastructure, um, we're not going to call those a separate EC category, but you can utilize capital expenditures within these certain guidance lines. Um, and so that was part of the renumbering um, of what they did with the uh, of with with the expenditure categories was to pull those capital out as specific categories, but then give additional guidance on what you have to do to um, report on capital. So that would cover both the public health that Sean just walked through. Um, the most common area within the public health that I see that utilized is in the um, um, air purification systems in public buildings, um, some building improvements for uh, being able to keep people more separated. Um, so those type of projects are no longer a specific category, but they are still eligible under um, one of those um, other programs that are specifically listed out. Hannah, great, great point. And I also just want to make one last point on public health. So categories one and now two and three, as Hannah's about to walk through, those are specific categories that you need to tie into those expenses to COVID-19. So as we go through some of the other sections, whether it's water sewer infrastructure, revenue replacement, you don't necessarily need to tie those costs directly into a COVID-19 specific related reason. But these ones you do. So public, the public health and then categories two and three that Hannah will start talking about now. Thanks, Sean. And the other thing to point out, the difference between public health and negative economic impacts is that with public health, um, there's no requirement for showing that they are impacted or um, disproportionately impacted. As we get into the neg negative economic impacts, um, because they aren't necessarily directly supporting health, but more of the economy and the impact there, there are requirements um, tied to whether someone was impacted, uh, impacted communities, and then also disproportionately impacted. So we'll walk through the, that um, kind of differentiation in further detail. So within the um, negative economic impact, there's a few different categories, like with the public health, they had the four categories. Within um, negative economic impact, it starts out with assistance to households. Um, I'm not gonna walk through each of these items, which we just listed out the ECs for you. Um, you'll see the ha um, household assistance goes pretty in depth of the type of programs that you can do. Um, we'll walk through those in a little more detail in a minute. Um, 
And then you get into assistance to small businesses and then assistance to nonprofits and then aid to impacted industries. They also have this other category at the end that they, uh, they do give some guidance on. If it doesn't fit anywhere else, how do you determine if something is, um, is allowable use that's not enumerated? Um, and then finally, the category three, which they lumped in with the um, economic impact is the uh, public sector capacity. So this is where the rehiring of public sector staff, um, payroll and benefits for the public health, and then they've also added in some categories in there here for effective service delivery. So we'll talk about um, kind of what that is when we get to that section. So let's start out with the um, impact to households. So as I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, there is a designation between what is an impacted household and what is a disproportionately impacted household. Um, so the treasury does give guidelines on what that is. Some of it they're utilizing um, guidelines that are already out there. But in essence, um, for the impacted communities, it's a little easier to um, fall into that category at or below 300% of the federal poverty guidelines um, or 65% of area of median income. Um, I think they give that option of using the area median income because certain places, um, they have a higher cost of living and so they have higher uh, income requirements to, to live there. So for instance, I think California is a good example of that. Uh, Massachusetts is another example of that where we have a higher than average um, medium income. So they do allow you to use either one of those thresholds. Um, and then also looking at households that are experiencing unemployment or in increased food or housing insecurity. Um, if a household is already qualifying for CHIP or Medicaid, um, if they're already part of another affordable housing initiative that's already been approved for. Um, and then also looking at um, instructional time for K through 12 so for some of these students who may have had a, a significant impact. For the disproportionately impacted um, households, and as a note on here, we have some page numbers listed. That, those are page numbers from the final rule where you can find the um, specific information. So as you can tell from this, pages 29 to 46, the final rule goes through quite a bit of detail um, on exactly how these all go. So we try to just uh, summarize it here for you. But for the disproportionately impacted, you're looking at um, households that are at or below 185% of the, the federal poverty or 50% of the area um, medium income. Also, if they are um, any household that resides in a qualified census tract is automatically deemed to be disproportionately impacted. And also if they are currently qualified for SNAP, uh, Medicare, some of these other you know, initiatives like Head Start, uh, WIC, Section 8 housing and Pell Grants, those households are deemed to be automatically um, disproportionately impacted. And then if you're a household that resides in a US territory or a tri um, tribal government, then um, that's also considered disproportionately impacted. So that designation will tell us what type of projects we can do for those areas. Now, the one thing that um, we didn't have listed out in there is if you are looking at one of these projects that is encompassing not a specific household, but more of an area and neighborhood, for instance, on the uh, right hand of your screen where it talks about disproportionately impacted households and communities, um, I think about the fourth bullet down, it says investments in neighborhoods to promote improved healthy outcomes. Um, within that, or even the improvement to vacant abandoned property, this isn't specific to one household. So what the guidance um, tells us to do is that for those areas where it's encompassing more than one household, it's something that's benefiting a community, you have to look at the community or the immediate area um, as a whole. And if on average those households would uh, qualify, then you can deem that that whole community is an impacted community. Um, if you go into the uh, summary of the final rule that we talked about before, they do have a whole section on that as well. I believe it's page 19 um, that you can walk through what it looks like to um, qualify an entire area for that. But otherwise, for most of these programs like food assistance, emergency housing assistance, those are at the um, household level, individual level of whether or not they qualify. So if if they fit into either impacted or disproportionately impacted, then the enumerated uses that are on the left are things that you are able to offer to those households. Um, in order to get the additional programs that are on the right side of your screen, um, you have to also qualify as disproportionately impacted. 
So they're basically just giving additional help that you can provide to those communities or those households. Um, but you know, most of it is um, pretty standard type of programs where you'd have um, some sort of application process, um, providing food assistance, emergency housing, health insurance assistance. You can actually do um, straight cash assistance. Um, my caution here would just be to whatever program you decide to do, make sure you have a documented process for how you're going to handle the application, what's going to be required to be submitted with the application, who's reviewing it, um, you know, and, and how you will determine who qualifies and who doesn't. So just make sure that that process is all documented and that it, it is offered and available to anyone in your community that would meet those thresholds. Um, so moving into the assistance for small businesses, um, first the Treasury actually defines what is a small business. So it has to be a business that's under 500 employees um, and then also qualifies under Section 3 of the Small Business Act as a small business. So similar to assistance to household, there is a breakdown between an impacted small business and then a disproportionately impacted um, once again, similar to the households, if you, if the business resides in a qualified census tract, it's automatically deemed to be disproportionately impacted. Um, and if it's operated by a tribal government or, or on tribal lands or in a U.S. territory, it's considered disproportionately impacted. Otherwise, on the um, impacted side, they need to just show that they've had a decrease in revenue or receipts. They have some sort of financial insecurity, um, increased costs capacity due to the financial hardship or challenge covering their operating costs because of the pandemic. Once again, like Sean said earlier, these categories, you do have to show a, a direct tie-in, um, a result, you know, that these impacts are a result of COVID, not um, some other, uh, you know, some other reasoning behind it. You do have to make sure there, there is that tie-in. So if you're having some sort of application process with a small business, you could, um, you know, as an example, you could ask what were your average annual revenues pre-COVID, what are they currently, you know, and showing that there's been a reduction. Um, if they're in some of the specific enumerated uh, categories of businesses, it makes it a little easier to show that tie-in. Um, and then very similar qualification for assistance to nonprofits, um, basically exact same as for small businesses, only this is for nonprofit. Um, and then as far as the aid to impacted communities, uh, I'm sorry, aid to impacted industries, there are some specifically listed out the travel, tourism, and hospitality sector. Um, if a business is in one of those three, it's, are, it's automatically um, designated as impacted. If it's not in any of those categories, but if they can show that they've lost at least 8% um, in employment, from pre-pandemic levels or um, showing comparable or worse economic impacts to one of those three sectors, then you can then um, provide additional aid to those impacted industries, um, similar to what you would with the nonprofits and the businesses. Um, within that, you can do aid to mitigate financial hardship that can be um, you know, financial, like a, a grant program, um, you know, awarding them a certain amount of money. It can be assistance to, um, help them to reopen the business post COVID, um, technical assistance and you know, mitigation and infection prevention, preventative measures. Um, any of those type of programs you can uh, award to these impacted industries. And then finally uh, within, it's actually section three within the um, expenditure categories is the public sector rehiring. Prior to February, the original report reporting documentation that came out really just had this one, one category within here, and that was the rehiring of public sector staff. Um, what they then did was grouped in the, um, I think it was in prior in the public health category, um, specific uh, salary type um, expenditures for public safety, public health, and human services staff. Those were moved over to this public sector category. Um, and then also the rehiring of public sector staff. With the interim final rule, they allowed you to bring back your um, FTE count at your, biz at your uh, government agency to the pre-pandemic levels. So that being said, if you had 300 FTEs uh, at the start of pandemic, you had to lay um, some staff off 
uh, for instance, um, recreation staff or you know other um, parks and rec staff because those things weren't being utilized or because you couldn't offer the programs. Um, so you might have gone down to 275. Well, with the interim final rule, you could bring your um, FTE count back up to, five, to the 300 level to make it exactly what it was before. And the additional cost of bringing it back up to that level could be put onto the ARPA fund. What they've come out with with the final rule actually is in addition to bringing it back to the pre-pandemic level, the Treasury is recognizing that um, in, in many cases, the pandemic is in order to offer the same level of service, not only do you need to get back to your pre-pandemic level, but you actually need to get back to a higher level um, because of the additional um, programs that are being run and the additional needs in the community. And so they're actually allowing you to not only get back to that pri prior level, but to increase it up to, um, I believe it's 7% above what the pre-pandemic level is. There is, um, in the final rule, there is a very specific formula of how you calculate what that was before, what that is now, um, to make sure that um, you can justify that FTE change. Along with the, the direct costs of the employees, you can also um, cover their benefits, um, their, you know, whether it's health insurance, um, any of those other, uh, the retirement um, contributions for those employees for, during that time, those can also go against the grant. Um, the other thing I wanna point out with this rehiring of public sector staff that hasn't been, um, you know, it, it's been a confusion for a lot of our clients is that the rehiring does not have to be the same uh, employees that were let go. So if, for instance, you cut back on your, um, your recreation programs, and so you had to lay off some recreation employees, but now where your needs really lie are you need additional police officers um, or teachers. The calculation is purely just an FTE count. So it does not have to be the same employees. Um, it does not have to be the same positions. It's just a, a number in essence, um, of what you can hire back to, to be included in here. They're also allowing that you can, with this program, offer um, worker retention incentives, which I know has been very, um, very key for some of the clients, because as many know, a lot of uh, public employees are either retiring or uh, moving to greener pastures, whatever that may be. I think a lot of places are having a hard time finding employees to hire. So you are able to use the ARPA funds to do different incentive programs to help with that. And then the final section, um, effective service delivery. So what that is, initially with the interim final rule, that would have been covered under the administrative cost category. Um, but what they're saying is, you know, some administrative costs are, gen are just generic administrative costs of the grant. Some of them are very specific to running specific programs. So for instance, if you needed to, if, if you were a large community and were doing a large housing assistance program and needed to hire a part-time person to just run that, um, that specific project, that housing program, or do the community outreach to help identify um, the needs and who to use, then that would be considered um, part of effective service delivery. So it wouldn't go into the administrative bucket, it would go into um, this public sector hiring and employment use category. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Sean to talk about premium pay for essential workers. Thank you, Hannah. And I do just wanna to touch base upon a few things you said from that section there. I think category two um, is extremely helpful and useful in terms of helping out impacted industries, aid to tourism, et cetera. But as Hannah mentioned earlier too, you don't wanna just be selective in terms of, I've got a friend that works at a nonprofit. Great, let's help them out. You need to run a program and you need to make sure you offer it to everyone who may want uh, to, to have that program. And there needs to be an application process. With that, it can certainly take a lot of bandwidth. If let's say you're a smaller city or town, you don't have the employees, ARPA does give you the ability under that effective service delivery to go out and hire an FTE or half-time half FTE to go in there and help you deliver those services. Otherwise, it can be burdensome if you're trying to run these programs yourself with no additional help. So I just wanted to make sure we, we covered that. Yeah, Sean, that's a great point. Um, and some of that differentiation, so if you say go out and do an application process for any nonprofit within a certain sector, like food, um, you know, like uh, uh, food pantries, 
and you open it wide open like that, and then then that can be considered aid to the nonprofit. If you're mm-hmm. saying I'm going to work with this one food pantry to run this one pr- specific program I want them to do, well, that's no longer aid to that nonprofit. That is a subrecipient type agreement. So that's where you, um, when you don't open it wide open to the in- the entire community as a whole, that's where you might run into issues of now it becomes a subrecipient type agreement, which has additional requirements related to it. Yep, absolutely. Great point, Hannah. And just to close out on that, I, I do believe, and correct, Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, if you are offering these type of programs, you have to offer them within the borders of your municipality. So yeah. let, let's say you do want to open it up to nonprofits, right? If, if I'm a, the, the town of X, I can only offer it, offer it to nonprofits within my town of X. I can't go across my border and offer it to a, a town for a nonprofit two towns away. You have to do it within your constraints. Correct. Excellent. All right. Pressing forward to premium pay, which is my least favorite category, and I'll explain why. So when the Treasury came out with ARPA and they started talking about premium pay, there's basically two sectors, two categories, public sector employees and also private sector grants to other employees. When myself and Hannah and and our team look at this too, the intent of premium pay is to help out the lowest paid workers, those who were actively you know, putting their lives at danger, helping out the public, interacting with the public. Um, And we're actually, you know, not teleworking, but actually physically at their job. And the reason I'm I'm leery about premium pay is twofold. A, documentation, documentation, and auditing, right? The amount of documentation I would personally want to have on file to make sure that A, I'm doing calculations correctly, that B, I have support for my audit to make sure that I can substantiate how I deemed it reasonable and eligible for certain individuals to have premium pay can take a lot of work. Uh, Secondly is the political piece of it. Now, luckily, I don't have to necessarily get myself involved with that piece of it, but if you start offering premium pay to one collective bargaining unit versus another or one sector of your workforce versus another, uh, I can only imagine the letters, phone calls, emails that you would receive as someone trying to administer this type of program for premium pay. So let's get, into, let's get into the overview of premium pay. So as I mentioned, you can provide premium pay to eligible workers, which we'll get to. Premium pay may be awarded to eligible workers up to $13 per hour, and it must be in addition to wages or compensation to the eligible workers otherwise received. Overall, one individual cannot exceed more than 25 grand for a single worker for this program. You can pay it out. You can, excuse me, pay it out in installments or lump sum um, to the hourly, part-time, or salaried workers. Premium pay is one of those um, interesting cases too for ARPA is that it can be paid out retrospectively. So you can go back to, oh God, I think it was March of 21, Hannah. Correct me if I'm wrong for the date in terms in terms of premium pay. March of 2020. March of 2020. Thank you. So I had my dates wrong. Um, So that is one of the rare instances for ARPA where you can go backwards prior to uh, ARPA being eligible and back when COVID-19 actually started. Uh, ARPA funds cannot be used to reimburse itself for premium pay or hazard pay that was already paid out. Uh, And most, not maybe not most notably, but uh, frustrating to some, um, premium pay cannot be paid to volunteers, right? You're volunteering your own time. You're a volunteer for a reason. You don't get paid. So they're not eligible under premium pay. So Sean, can, can you just go back to that page yeah. for a second? So just to jump in to clarify, because um, this has been confusing to some where it says, okay, well, you just said that you can go backwards to March 20th, but then you also say you can't reimburse yourself. So the differentiation there is you can look back at the hours that were worked by that employee all the way back to March of 2020, but you have to be think about it as cash basis, you have to actually be paying them for that after ARPA was instituted as a program. Um, so that's just to clarify that piece. The other part of it is because there is a specific per hour limit and dollar limit for the employees, um, one thing that we've seen is, so I would say a caution, if you're doing a program like that, you just can't say, I'm just going to get of all employees a $5,000 premium pay bonus. You can't do that because you have to be able to prove out and document that it's no more than 13 an hour for the hours they worked in person. Um, and it, you know, 
obviously you'll know if it's up, up below the 25,000, but you have to be able to document the hours that were worked working in person and that it's no more than that $13 threshold. Oh, great points, Hannah. And I, I wish they, they, they wrote the rule where it was a lump sum and you could just do it that way, but unfortunately it's not the way the rules are written. Um, no one asked us. <laughs> so steps to provide premium pay. Uh, I believe there's three steps in order to do this. First, we have to identify what an eligible worker is. And the way that the final rule dictates that is that it's a worker needed to maintain continuity of operations of critical or of essential critical infrastructure sectors. And they call out some of those below. Number two is you have to verify the worker performed essential work, meaning, as I already stated, you were not teleworking from a residence. So maybe you're sitting in town, you had people in doing kind of skeleton crew off and on schedules. Maybe someone came in Monday, Wednesday, Friday of one week, and then Tuesday, Thursday of another week. Those days that they were working from home would not qualify under premium pay. They also have to be involved in regular in-person interactions, whether it's the public, coworkers, or handling items. So as I'm sure like many of you, if you do go to an office, you might not have seen anyone else that entire day. So they necessarily wouldn't qualify under part 2-2 here in order to provide premium pay. Number three is confirming that the premium pay responds to workers performing that essential work for the public health emergency. So you can do this one of three ways. Eligible workers receiving premium pay is earning, with the premium included, at or below 150% of the state or county's average annual wage for occupations. So you can find this information out on the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, since we're speaking to California, depending upon where you are, right, your average may be a lot higher than you know some other clients that we've been talking to in other areas of the country. Uh, number two, eligible worker receiving premium pay is not exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act overtime provisions. And number three, if all else fails, if a worker does not meet either one of the two requirements above, then that recipient must submit written justification to Treasury detailing how the premium pay is otherwise responsive to workers performing the essential work during the emergency. So this is where I get caught up as a former auditor too. If I have to submit writ written justification to the feds, I want that to be bulletproof. And what we are seeming, seemingly finding is that when certain clients start talking about premium pay, the written justification becomes a lot harder when they have to put it down on paper and really have to prove it out on their end. So that's just my cautionary tale that if you go down this route, just make sure you have all your ducks in a row um, and you can sort of support your, your theory. And Sean, along with that first point under there, the 150%, now just to clarify too, and it's specified in the final rule, that includes all earnings. So for Correct. instance, if you have um, employees who are doing additional detail work or overtime, you have to take their entire um, pay into account including what you're going to add to their pay to calculate that 150%. So this is another reason why um, doing that lump sum, everybody gets the same thing, isn't necessarily, um, you know, isn't allowable and doesn't qualify here because you have to do these different um, support and calculations. Nope, great point, Hannah. And just to further that along too, you know, as an example, if you have a, uh, a police officer, and let's say he makes 80 grand per year, that's his base salary. And then if he does OT, if he's doing double shifts, if he's doing details, and he or she, then that increases that base amount, making it less likely for them to be able to receive premium pay through the 150%. To close out on premium pay, um, these are the enumerated eligible workers that the, the feds are saying that yes, we deem these occupations to be eligible. Um, and beyond this, again, you, the government, may be able to designate additional non-public sectors as critical. You just have to define it. So when I look at this list and I think of the intent of ARPA and the premium pay, uh, you know, social services, um, there is uh, election workers, there's gas station attendants, grocery store workers, all those who were always out in public, always involved in COVID-19, perhaps putting themselves more at risk than another, um, physically at their job. Um, so that really wraps up the premium pay section. Hannah, do you have anything to add before we move on to the next one? 
the only thing I would qualify here with this um, eligible workers list, this qualifies for step one in the process. So just because a worker is on this list doesn't say, hey, I automatically qualify. That's just saying, does the type of work you do qualify? Then you have to go through those other steps as well. Of did, were they working in person? How many hours were they and doing those calculations? So um, just wanna make sure and clarify that. Thank you, Hannah, for clarifying that. Uh, next category, which is category five, uh, infrastructure, water, sewer, broadband. Uh, one of my favorite subjects and one of my favorite expenditure categories. Why? Because I feel like it's an easy use of spending money. Uh, we've actually had some clients say to us, you know, a, a small town, maybe they've never received federal money. Maybe they receive it, you know, every so often. They now just received an influx of millions of dollars and they don't know how to spend it or spend it correctly within the terms of ARPA. So we tell them, water sewer infrastructure, right? Do you have an enterprise fund for water, a sewer, a combined one? Do you have clean water projects? Do you have drinking water projects? This is an easy way for you not to use your retained earnings, not to go out for bonding, and you can use opera funds to fund a program or fund a project that you want to do maybe for years. So the feds break it out between water and sewer, all under 5.1 through 5.18. Then they also break it down between broadband. Uh, broadband, relatively, I would say, new sector in terms of what uh, COVID-19 funds can be used for. And we'll go into these specifics as we go here. So for water sewer infrastructure projects, uh, I think every, most people I'm sure are aware that there are clean water state revolving fund projects. If they qualify under that, they qualify under ARPA. Um, whether that's construction of publicly owned treatment plants, management and treatment of uh, storm water and drainage water, um, energy consumption reduction for publicly owned treatment works, Anything falling under that Clean Water State Revolving Fund qualifies under this. So again, it's a, in my eyes, a nice easy way to get a big project passed through ARPA and doesn't impact the taxpayers of your city, town, community, et cetera. Uh, similar to the previous slide, which was the Clean Water State Revolving, we also have the Drinking Water State Revolving. So again, anything as part of that revolving type fund project also qualifies under ARPA, whether it's improvements to drinking water quality new sources to replace contaminated drinking water, uh, new community water systems, uh, and also green infrastructure. So as part of ARPA, they do hit on the green aspect of certain programs. And in this case, it would include green roofs, harvesting rainwater collections, um, so on and so forth. So to me, when I have clients talking about how can we spend this money, how can we possibly spend these millions of dollars when we don't really have a big need didn't really see a big loss per se, I always put him to this one. Um, and Sean, just if I can jump in there real quick too, Please. just to also once again clarify some more too, is because um, this question has come up from a lot of our clients. So do I, that, does that mean I have to go actually apply for one of these revolving funds to show that it, uh, it met this requirement? No, what the treasury was saying was, hey, we already have pretty good guidelines out there for what qualifies under drinking water or clean water acts. And if you would be able to apply and qualify under these two acts, then it's, it's basically an easy way for them to um, have some existing guidelines out there. So you don't have to actually go out and apply for those programs. Right. It just has the same type of programmatic um, requirements. So this is where I've um, told, recommended with clients, work with your DPW directors because they've most likely, if you have a water or sewer system, they've most likely dealt with these programs before. And so they're aware of them. Um, there are pretty good uh, um, links out there. If you just even look up those two cap those two revolving funds, they have very specific uh, PDFs that are available online of what goes into the various types of those programs, what's allowable uses, um, expenditures within those categories and not. Um, so it's pretty easy to follow along with that. And that's why the treasury basically said, hey, we're gonna make this a little easier on ourselves and say, use existing requirements that are already out there. And if, you know, if it would meet those, we're good with it. No, great point. And not to steal of any Allison's thunder later on when it comes to reporting, but for your water sewer infrastructure projects, there is certainly um, a little bit more reporting to do. They wanna know, you know uh, completion end dates, they need a permit number. So as Hannah mentioned, work through DPW, your, your public works, your engineering department, uh, they've probably gone through that before and have that documentation. So uh, easier from, for them to look at it versus, you know, a finance department, if you will, or a grants management perspective. 
Um, they also identify other necessary projects, and of course, they also help define necessary as to what that is. Um, culvert repairs, infrastructures to improve safe water, uh, dam and reservoir rehabilitations. I actually had a client the other day, uh, they have a dam in their town and they needed to make a repair, so they were able to use some ARPA funds to, to make that happen. Uh, and also, there's a, there's a broad set of lead remediation projects, too, that are eligible. Um, I know a lot of communities around here, with some of the old piping and some of the old um, infrastructure here in New England, um, they also have lead, remedi lead remediation projects that they're already doing. Um, they can certainly use some of these funds to also supplement that program that they're working on. And of course, when we talk necessary, everyone has their own definition. Well, here's the Treasury's definition of necessary, which is really the only one that matters. Uh, it has to be a responsive to an identified need to achieve or maintain an adequate level of service, which may include a reasonable projected increase needed due to population growth or otherwise. So let's think of it this way. If you have a, and I'm just gonna make up numbers, if you have a $10 million uh, uh, infrastructure project or some kind of um, treatment plant, if you go and build a $100 million treatment plant, you're probably overstepped because unless you're expecting rapid population growth, you probably went overboard. So that wouldn't be, quote, necessary. Um, a cost-effective means for meeting that need, taking into account available alternatives, um, and also for investments in infrastructure that supply drinking water in order to meet that projected population growth. So again, it just has to be reasonable into what you're expecting. Um, building something four times as large as you need uh, would not qualify under the necessary category. And I would have that documented of what that projection is. If you're going to um, build beyond what you currently need, have that in your documentation and your justification, you know, where you got that growth number from. I would agree. And I'm not going to sound like broken records, but document, document, document. Uh, certainly, I would want to answer those questions up front versus years down the road. Uh, the other component of uh, Category 5 here is the broadband infrastructure. So depending upon where you are, broadband may be abundant, it may be lacking. So in order for it to be eligible, uh, it encourages prioritized locations without access to 100 to 200 uh, megabytes per second, uh, where there's a lack of reasonable high-speed broadband connection or reliable service. The requirements, uh, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a techie guy per se, but it has to be 100 um, uh, megabytes per second download speed um, and it has to be scalable um, for those upload and download speeds as well. There's also a low income subsidy program that it can also be used for. So if you participate in the FCC's affordable connectivity programs uh, or provide access to low income uh, program commensurate to in, in those ACPs. So again, depending upon the community you are, this may be something that you hear about, see about, others may have never heard about it or, or seen it in general. Um, and last but not least, for broadband infrastructure, they added this actually after the interim final rule. So when the final rule came out, um, and I don't know if anyone was watching the news recently, um, between uh, the, the war in Ukraine, Russia, uh, general hacks in general, I think the government basically said, this is something that we really need to uh, invest in and have the potential for our, our subrecipients to invest in, which is cybersecurity. Uh, which includes modernization of hardware and software, right? I know we personally, Hannah and I have had clients out here, whether it's a city or town, uh, they've had their servers held for ransom for two weeks. Uh, a complete financial system was down for four days for another city, and they were being hijacked and used for ransomware until they got some cryptocurrency. So by performing these assessments and getting in there and digging into potential upgrades will only help strengthen your community, your city, your town going forward. And ARPA is a great way to pay for that. Because I know a lot of the times it kind of falls on the back end because we don't have the funding, we don't have the resources. Um, well, now you do. You can hire someone to do this program for you. You can hire someone to do a, an assessment for you. Um, and it'll ultimately help out the, your community going forward. So with that, I will turn it over to Hannah's favorite category, revenue replacement. Well, I was just going to say, um, I would say this is probably most communities' favorite uh, category <laughs> is revenue replacement. Um, it, also, it also is the one that had the biggest changes with the final rule. Um, so let's just first, you know, look at the 
uh, expenditure categories of what they call is very limited. You saw with um, both the public health and the um, economic impact, there were a lot of different types of categories. Here, it's really just two. Provision of governmental services, which we will go through that in detail, um, and then a non-federal non match for other federal programs. So in this category, in this category only, if you have a, um, say you have a program where the feds are paying for 75%, but they're requiring you to do 25% match, you can use a portion of your revenue replacement allocation to um, provide that match for that program. Um, otherwise, it would have to qualify under this provision of local services. So with revenue loss, there's several pieces to it. So first there's how much revenue loss do I have? So the major news that came out with the final rule, which was a shock to a lot of people, and you know, it was probably the buzz around town um, amongst the governmental entities, was that with the final rule, the, um, the Treasury is allowing any community, no matter how much funds you receive, to allocate up to $10 million of their, um, their funds towards revenue loss. So if you're a smaller entity who received $10 million or less in ARPA direct funds, then you can utilize all of yours. You can say, I'm counting all of my, um, all of my funds as revenue loss. So that's only step one though. So you're not done. When, in fact, I had somebody uh, was working on their NEU report, expenditure report the other day, and there's a section where you check off, are you gonna use the allowance and then how much, you know, of your, you know, how much are you claiming against that? Um, so they thought then they were done. Okay, so I don't have to report anymore. No, that's just part of it. That's just saying how much of it are you going to use for revenue loss? Then you still have to spend it for one of the eligible uses within this category, and you still have to um, report on that to the feds by the project, um, within the project field and as you're spending it down. Because you may not spend all of that in one year, and I would recommend you probably shouldn't spend it all in one year. Um, you may want to make sure you are providing for future programs that may be necessary. Um, so they allowed you to do this allowance. Um, one of the confusions that we've had with many of our clients is, well, I didn't have a revenue loss. It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter. You don't have to prove. If you claim this allowance, you do not have to show or prove at all that you had any amount of revenue loss. It's similar if you're doing your own personal taxes, um, whether you itemize your deductions or claim the standard deduction. Um, that's probably pertinent because some of you may still be working on your taxes since they're due, I believe, on Monday. Um, so I, I explaining it as that it's closest to that in that um, there's no requirement to actually show that you had that amount of revenue loss. You just check the box that I'm taking the standard allowance. Um, so that's, that was a pretty major change that really was beneficial. And I think the reasoning for it, um, they were trying to make it as administratively um, easy on the smaller entities who don't necessarily have the capacity to run these major programs. Um, if you're not going to use the standard allowance, say you're a larger entity and you're like, hey, I think over the life of ARPA, I'm gonna have a lot more than 10 million in revenue loss, then you're gonna be required to do the actual um, calculation. It's a very specific calculation. Um, I did put a, a, a link to a resource on here. We did a, um, a webinar on CLA's um, site um, specifically to revenue loss and walked through the calculation, what's included. Um, we don't have time to go through that level of detail on this on, on today's um, site, but overall, the couple important pieces um, to with calculating that is it's entity-wide, so it's not just looking at general fund. Um, a lot of our clients, they've said, oh, I have this much in revenue loss, and we come in and do the calculation, and either they're you know, way below or way over um, because they didn't take into account some of their um, special revenue funds, some revolving funds, um, even some non-federal grant um, type programs are included in the calculation. Um, those things can dramatically sway the, um, the end result. So looking at it as an entity wide um, and then backing out certain revenues that are not to be included um, is the, the best way to go about it. So if you are interested in, in a little more information on the spe specifics of how to do that calculation, if you um, forecast you're gonna do more than 10 million over the life of the grant, then I would encourage you to um, either uh, go through, you know, 
uh, see that other webinar that was put together or you know reach out for assistance if you need help. Um, the other thing I would point out on the 10 million standard allowance, that's a one-time allowance. So that's not 10 million a year, that is for the life of the grant. So if you check off on that, um, you know, that is your maximum for the life of the grant. So once you know how much revenue loss funds you have to spend, what can you spend it on? So it's, you can't just take that money and dump it into your general fund and let it fall to your fund balance. That's not allowable. Um, and so they gave, I, the, the interim final rule basically said general governmental services, and they gave a few examples. With the final rule, they actually added some to it. Um, so it's basically, it's any traditional um, governmental service that's provided by the government that you're legally allowed to provide, um, you know, because there may be some state-specific uh, legality related to it. So it needs to be something that you are legally able to provide. Um, and something that would be traditionally um, provided by the government. So going into that, they actually then enumerated a few additional uses um, beyond what you typically think of your norm operating um, governmental service type projects to say, you can do constructions of schools and hospitals. Um, so now we're looking at capital type projects. Under the interim final rule, it was not um, clear that you would be able to spend the revenue loss on capital programs. They clarified that with the final rule. So you can do um, what some may call like pay as you go capital, uh, building, uh, road building and maintenance, other infrastructure type projects. You can utilize the government, uh, the uh, revenue loss funds for those governmental services. Um, in addition, you can do uh, environmental environmental remediations, the normal, you know, what most people think of as governmental services, police, fire, public safety. Um, this would include purchases of large purposes like fire trucks and police vehicles. Um, several of my smaller clients, that's where they're, they're going for is some of those large expensive vehicle purchases like a fire truck. Um, I think the fire trucks range from 650,000 to over a million dollars for a fire truck. A smaller entity may not have the opportunity to do that very often, and so they they basically run them till they die, and then they have to go out and issue debt in order to purchase a new one. So this is a good opportunity if you don't necessarily have some of the other needs that some communities have, that this would be a good place to look at um, helping with some of those capital projects. So. Um, so this is just kind of one list of enumerated uses. The final rule says that's not um, a complete list. You can certainly um, justify other types of expenses. Where they do say is anything that would kind of fall into that category of general use, except, and then they go through some specific exceptions of what you cannot spend these funds on. So you cannot use your revenue loss funds to reduce your tax, your uh, your net tax revenue. You cannot use it to deposit to a pension fund um, to try and you know lower your pension liability. Um, you cannot use it for debt service or to replenish reserves, which means you can't just let it fall to your fund balance. Um, and then you can't use it for settlements and judgment, judgments and then some other general restrictions. The idea behind it is they want you to use it on current costs. So with debt service, you've already issued that debt. You've already purchased that item back prior to this, right? Um, However, even though you, you can't do debt service, but you can avoid future debt service by using this for you know, current capital that you may have otherwise gone out for debt for. But as long as you haven't actually issued any debt for the project yet, then you would be able, and it fall, fell within that, um, those enumerated uses, then you could use it. And it, in essence, it um, keeps you from having to pay that debt service somewhere down the road. But things that have already been issued for, you cannot um, pay for it. They want you to use it for new expenditures from the time that ARPA um, was approved and going forward. They don't want you to try and pay off old expenses that were out there because it goes back to they're also tr with this, these funds trying to help spur the economy. So there is part of that um, economic impact buried within those requirements of using these funds for current expenditures. That's the same idea of why they don't want you depositing it to pension funds, because that's depositing it for a future expense, not for a current expense. Um, so this just kind of goes into a little detail of what um, it means to be using it to offset the revenue. The final rule does have a very specific um, calculation. Once again, just like everything else, that's why there's 437 pages in the final rule of 
how you can prove out that it's not being used to um, decrease your tax uh, rate. And then, um, like I said, it doesn't it doesn't allow you to use it to a pension fund. Now, theoretically, it does not specifically say you cannot use it for OPEB. Um, if you have an OPEB reserve or OPEB fund similar to your pension trust, um, it, it doesn't, the final rule we were, a lot, everyone was hoping they would clarify in the final rule because they only talked about pension. They did not. The final rule was um, silent on OPEB as well. But if you could look back to the, you know, what I mentioned before, the idea of this is to spend it on current expenses. I think you can, you know, make a nexus between the OPEB fund and the pension funds and reserve funds that, you know, those are for a future expense down the road. And Hannah, um, just, just about OPEB too. So when we get asked, hey, CLA, would you approve of a, a project where we're funding OPEB? The answer is no. <laughs> we are not greenlighting that project. And what we've been telling clients is that instead of you in using your ARPA funds to, to benefit your OPEB, you can use this, this ARPA bucket to use it for other general government services, then freeing up some other budget so that you can put towards your OPEB contribution. So, you know, a little bit, I don't call it a shell game per se, but you are moving costs around so that you can actually use it under the eligible uses. Right. So, yeah, so exactly what you assign to this um, category, you know, go with the stuff that's very clear, very, um, you know, black and white, whether or not it's allowable. Um, stay away from those gray areas um, because you can, you know, Re rethink about how you're funding the different projects and just reallocate how those your different revenue sources are being used for these different projects um, to make it as the lowest level of risk as possible. I would just say that I think that's how I would put it is that that OPEB, I do know some who have different opinions, but I when I look at it being an um, accountant, we are naturally more risk averse, I think. Um, and I just see that as a very risky area um, because of the intent. Um, there's a lot of language in the final rule that talks about the intent of uh, of the ARPA funds and what they want you to use it for. The intent is to use it for current expenses. Um, so then this was, just goes into the other detail of the debt service rep replenishing financial reserves, um, settlements and judgments, um, and then kind of this other category. You can't use it to violate conflicts of interest, to violate any other federal, state, or local regulation. One of the other things listed here that was interesting that came out with the final rule was um, there have been instances where mandates were put into place and um, certain communities were, you know, choosing to not follow those mandates. If they, if you cannot use, um, they specifically said in the final rule, you cannot use these funds to pay the penalties for not following COVID-19 mandates um, because that's basically going against what they're trying to do with these funds and to help to help improve the public health. So that was kind of another area that was um, that was listed out under this other category. Um, so that is the uh, overview of the revenue loss. So I'm going to turn it back over to Sean to discuss the administrative costs. Great, thank you, Hannah, and great overview. Um, I, I think Hannah's other presentation she did on demystifying revenue loss and the calculation itself was like an hour and a half. So I mean, the amount of time we could spend on that is, uh, you know, we could be here all day. So definitely check out the link if you are calculating your own uh, revenue loss or if you want to learn more about it in detail. Category seven, the last real category um, is administrative. Fairly quick, fairly simple. Um, there's administrative expenditures and then there's transfers to other units of government. So when we think about those two areas, sort of eligible uses, kind of basic uses for 7.1, Salaries and benefits of employees administering the grant. So let's say you hired an ARPA administrator. Um, if you hired additional staff to run ARPA out of your grant division, your grant department, you could pay for the, those costs right out of ARPA under 7.1. Let's say you hired um, third parties to come in and do it. Maybe a consultant, uh, you outsourced it. Same thing, all those costs, you can pay directly through ARPA. Uh, if you have some kind of you know solution built that we'll talk about in the next, um, the upcoming session here. Uh, you can bill that time and, and charge that time to administrative. Also legal services. If you are sub-recipient, uh, if you are uh, doling out money to a sub-recipient, you're gonna wanna have a grant agreement. You're gonna wanna have a terms and conditions on how those monies are used. So certainly legal services for that and drawing up those contracts 
would be uh, eligible under this use. And, and lastly, under 7.2, transfers to other units of government. So as an example, out here, one of our counties, they wanted to dole out money to subrecipients, meaning member, members, cities, and towns of their county, which is perfectly legal. They can transfer this money out to them as long as the use is covered by one of the expenditure categories and the restrictions from ARPA. So what does that mean, Sean? Great question. So if you wanted to dole up money, let's say under revenue replacement, if you select the $10 million allowance, that doesn't mean that you can dole out $10 million to all your different subrecipients. You've got the one $10 million use. So therefore, if you're transferring money to another segment of government, they are capped at that amount. So if I've got 10 different towns who all want money from me, each don't get the 10 million. They have one bucket of 10 million that you can allocate from and transfer to. And that goes with any expenditure category, um, but I just wanted to point out that one specifically for revenue replacement, because that has come up with a couple of our clients. Yep, and the language in the uh, final rule is that for any subrecipient agreement, um, whether it's for another unit of government or for a subrecipient with like a not-for-profit, they are bound by the eligible use by the direct recipient um, of those funds. So that being, if for some reason that direct mm -hmm. recipient due to some other regulation, state or federal, wasn't allowed to perform a certain amount of work, they can't give it to a subrecipient and say, go do this work for me because I can't do it. They are bound, the subrecipient is bound by the direct recipient's um, eligible uses. Correct, thank you, Hannah. And I'll actually kick it back to Hannah to cover our last major category, which are capital expenditures. So again, it's not an expenditure category as listed out um, for reporting, but it's in addition to. So Hannah? Absolutely, thanks, Sean. Um, so as I said at the very beginning, they broke, we used to have some um, EC uh, expenditure categories that were specific for capital. They changed that now and they pulled the capital out and said, you know, there are multiple of the expenditure categories could be theoretically used for, um, for capital. So instead of having those additional um, listed out, we're going to just have a, if you're going to do capital, here's the guidelines you need to follow. So um, this is basically covering the um, public health and negative economic impact category. Now, currently with the revenue loss, if you're doing capital under there, they're not requiring you to report on that at this time, but they have, uh, basically when you go in there, it, it has this, at this time, we're not requiring, you know, et cetera. So they could in the future theoretically do this as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is whether it's water, sewer, broadband, which is capital in nature already, so it, this is excluding those, um, or this public health, negative economic, or revenue loss, you still have to follow the federal procurement guidelines. So when you start talking capital, most likely you're gonna be in the greater than 250,000 um, category, which means you're gonna have to go out for an RFP um, for those types of expenditures. So just be aware that um, the reporting on this doesn't take the place of following the procurement guidelines. Um, so when we're looking at this, think public health and negative economic impact. Um, you know, that's really the area that right now they're having you report on. Um, so basically what they are, uh, th what they did, they, th the Treasury likes their charts and they put out this chart that said, um, there's basically two categories within the category. If you're using it on a capital expenditure that is specifically enumerated as an eligible use um, in the guidance, then you follow one set of rules. If it's not an enumerated use, but you've been able to, you know, prove out that this is um, eligible under kind of those other categories, then you have a different set of guidance. Um, for no matter which category you fall into, if it's less than a mil million dollars, um, so for instance, I have a client that's purchasing a $650,000 uh, fire engine. They don't need to uh, submit any kind of additional written justification for that. Um, because it's less than a million dollars. Now, if it's over a million, but less than 10 million, if it's enumerated in the treasury guidance, then you need to have that written justification, 
but you're not required to submit it to the Treasury. You just need to have it documented and in your files for when you go through the, your audit process. If it's not an enumerated list, you do have to submit that justification um, into the Treasury. And then anything over 10 million has to be submitted to the Treasury. Now, just to clarify, there's a lot of clarification because you know the Treasury had a lot of information out there. Just to clarify, they are not approving or re, you know pre-approving these capital expenditures. I had quite a few clients say, oh, well, they have to approve the capital. They're not approving it. They just want you to report on it and to submit the justification. That's not a, an approval process. It's just a requirement for reporting. Right. And, um, and, and Hannah, too, just to touch on that, Treasury is not pre-approving anything. So if any of you, if any of you are looking to do projects under any category, Treasury is not going to help you out. Um, I know there's an email address out there that I know we've asked questions to, clarifying questions. Um, the answer is typically read the final rule, even though we have a thousand times. So don't look for the Treasury to actually pre-approve a project for you or grant you approval. That's up to you, the individual right. direct recipient. We, yeah, we found that that email address is really only beneficial to more of like technical issues like, hey, one of our clients is having a problem with the Treasury site or something like that. They're not going to answer questions on is this project eligible or not. Um, they basically have said, hey, we've put an FAQ out there. We put the final rule out there. It's 437 pages long. You have all the information you need or speak to your auditors or, you know, something else like that. They're... Um, they're not going to pre-approve or review those for you. It's just about they're going to gather the information, you're reporting on it and submitting it to them through the portal. And then they're really heavily, I think part of it is they're really heavily relying on your single audit, um, the auditors to really look at and um, you know, making sure that you have the proper documentation that you um, have done your due diligence and making sure the project is eligible. Um, so going on the written dis, uh, justification, so thankfully they gave us some more information on what they're looking for with that. Um, so within that written justification, if you're required to have it, whether you have to submit it or not, um, you need to describe what the, the harm or need is to be addressed. So for instance, um, the most common one I'm seeing besides purchasing of vehicles or something like that, the co most common one I'm seeing is building improvements um, under that public health category. So whether that's um, some of our schools up here I know are aging and don't necessarily have AC systems. And so they found with the pandemic, it was very hard for them to keep that clean air um, when the students were in the classroom. So they had to, um, even during the winter time, keep windows open. So these kids are in class with their full you know, winter gear on because it's, um, they don't have the capacity to do these air filtration systems. So a lot of communities are looking to improve some of their buildings for that air purification. Um, so in that one, you would talk about the, you know, the need for the cleaner air um, to help, you know, uh, that you didn't have it before. Um, so describing what it is that uh, was exacerbated by the pandemic. And then the second part is explaining why a capital expenditure is appropriate, appropriate as opposed to um, another example would be, um, I have a client who's, um, they have a senior center, but the senior center prior to COVID was located as in a you know unused section of an elementary school. When the pandemic happened, um, even once things got a little um, you know less um, urgent and you know people started going out and about, they still didn't want to go back because the seniors were very concerned and worried about being near you know all these elementary kids um, because you know kids spread germs. Um, pretty well known fact. Um, and so they are. They were looking at: should we rent rent out a facility for the next three or four years, or should we build something from scratch? So that's one of those things of doing that comparative analysis of why should we do a capital expenditure versus, um, you know, a temporary fix like renting or leasing a um, a product. And then finally, um, which goes along with that, is comparing various, um, you know, solutions to that. Uh, you have to do a to an alternative um, capital expenditures and demonstrate why the one you chose was the proper one uh, to choose. Um, so they do list out, there are a few things that you are not allowed to use um, and 
do for capital. And that includes within that revenue loss category. Um, you cannot use the ARPA funds to construct a new correctional facility. Uh, you cannot construct new congregate facilities and you cannot use it to construct a convention center or stadium or other large you know, capital project that's intended to general, to, um, for general economic development in your area or, or industries. So if it's not an enumerated use, um, which you probably have heard that word, I, I think I've probably in the last two months heard that word more than I have in my entire life up until two months ago. Uh, but if you, if it's not an enumerated use, they give you a step-by-step -step of how do we figure out if this would be eligible, right? So first you need to identify what the COVID-19 public health impact was, um, design the response that addresses that impact. And then, you know, finally, the, the, the last piece of it is that reasonable um, word that they like to throw around. It needs to be reasonably proportional to the harm that was caused. Um, so, for instance, going back to my example of the senior center, um, if they, you know, have 20 seniors that regularly attend the senior center and they decide they're going to use the capital project and they've justified it through all these other pieces um, and they're going to use a capital project for it, then um, if they went and built a $50 million building, that's obviously not proportional to the need, right? If you have 10, 15, 20 people who are utilizing it. So looking at that reasonable scale, um, you know, is something that will be required as part of your justification. Um, and then making sure that you're targeting the response to those who, you know, need it, um, that, that are the ones who are being most harmed by it. And then you just have to consider the, the overall size of the project and, um, you know, that the reasonableness of the size of the project. Um, so that wraps up the capital section. Um, I think we have some time for some questions and answers. Um, I believe we have about 15 minutes. So. Um, sure, and Hannah, I can um, I can kick us off with some questions too that have, that have come up prior to, if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Great. So I know in the past when we've talked revenue calculation, and I, I know we couldn't go into everything today for it. Um, can you maybe just explain, uh, we know there's the lump sum option too, but can you just briefly explain the calculation, meaning calendar year versus fiscal year? Yeah, so it's interesting because in the interim final rule, you were required to use the calendar year for your, comp for your actual comparative. So um, it basically starts out with you first, you, you need to create what is that base year that you're going to compare to. Um, so what the, the guidance said was, it's basically the last complete fiscal year prior to COVID starting. So um, most of the clients that we work with are on a June 30th uh, fiscal year end. So for them, that base year that they're doing is June 30th of 2019 because the pandemic started in, I think officially in like February of 2020. Um, so their comparative year is going to be that 2019. But then with the interim final rule, it said, okay, now you're going to compare that to calendar year 2020. So they would take the actual revenues received from January 1st of 2020, which is really still kind of pre-pandemic, but all the way through to December 31st. Um, with the final rule, they actually gave you the option to do it on a fiscal year basis because many people came back and said, hey, because of the timing of when certain things hit, that's not really apples to apples. You're doing apples to oranges. So they gave you the ability to use either, you know, either fiscal year or calendar year. You can't just make up a different, you know, range. It has to be either your fiscal year or the calendar year. Um, so that's part of it. And then what you're doing is you're going to take the what they call the general revenues of the government, um, and in the easiest terms, compare. Um, a either a if you have a very high rate of growth for like the past three four years you can go back and and do a, a analysis of the three four years prior to COVID and if you have greater than 5.2 percent growth then you would use that that amount um, otherwise you can use their standard I think under the interim final rule it was 4.5 I believe and then they switched it under the five final rule to five. I think it's 5.2% that the standard rate to use. 
Um, I know there are certain groups out there like the GFOA who have put out um, actual templates for doing those calculations um, and actually even grouping it by the categories. Then within what is considered a eligible revenue to include in the calculation, they point to the Census Bureau's um, you know, uh, reports of what, what is classified as general governmental revenue. So if you go through those classifications, you know, that's gonna include your tax revenue, that's gonna include um, charges for services, um, fees, it, it does include state aid. Um, so if you're receiving funds from the state um, grant programs, that is gonna be included in there as well. Um, miscellaneous revenue, certain things. What they're saying to exclude is going to be um, like, number one, inner fund transfers. So if you're transferring from one fund to another, that's not truly a revenue. That's not money coming in from the outside. That's just moving money between your funds. So you're gonna exclude those. You're going to exclude um, agency and private pur purpose trust type revenues because those truly aren't available to the government to um, you know, spend on governmental services. Um, and then certain other, um, like inter, inter, with the interim final rule, certain other enterprise funds were excluded, but with the final rule, they gave you the option to include them if you wanted to, like your um, water system, if you have a water enterprise fund. Um, they gave you the option now if you wanna include it or not. Um, so like we said before, there is that, that other, um, webinar out there that goes into the very specifics of that, but I would encourage you to look at, um, you know, either that or go through the Census Bureau um, documentation that they show of what that category is, of uh, what's allowable and what's not, and certainly reach out if you, you know, for larger entities who need help with those calculations, um, you know, I would, if you have a ARPA consultant, reach out to them for assistance on it, or else you can always reach out to us with questions later. Great, thank you, Hannah. Um, something else that I know has come up in the past too is, uh, you know, what are some kind of risk assessment procedures? What do they look like? What can we do? And so we are currently helping out a community that has subrecipients. And things that we're doing is, number one, we're scheduling a risk assessment meeting. We're documenting their controls, their environment, um, if they've had a lot of turnover, what, what their procedures are um, in terms of cash handling. We're also looking at financial statements. If they've had you know, management letter comments, if they've had significant deficiencies, material weaknesses. If you're going through that risk assessment process, you may ultimately say, boy, this group's a little bit risky, but we still wanna award money. You can do so, but at least you can document your decisions and that may lead you to monitor more often, right? So let's say you have a subrecipient, you go through the risk assessment process and you're like, these guys are great. They've got all their ducks in a row, they've got good financials, they've got no reporting issues. You may only wanna monitor maybe on an annual basis. If it's something that's more riskier, maybe you wanna do it semi-annually. Maybe you wanna do it quarterly. Um, at least you have to document and, and get a risk assessment done in order to allocate money out to a subrecipient. So I just wanted to point that out. And, and one other question too, Hannah, that we've had in the past is, can you pre pay premium pay with revenue replacement funds? And the way it was phrased is sort of. So think of it this way. You can't necessarily give premium payout through revenue loss, but you could give out some kind of incentive through revenue right. loss, right? So there is a, go, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, so those communities, for example, who said, well, you know, we don't wanna have to go through all of that, you know, um, calculation and stuff with premium pay. We just wanna reward all of our staff who have worked, you know, especially hard, you know, whatever that, whoever that may be and say, everybody gets 5,000. Um, as long as there's no other state or federal things precluding you from doing that, um, that would be allowable under revenue loss. I think my only caution there for communities would be just making sure it's not setting a precedent and making sure that you're taking care of anybody who's, um, you know, that may be eligible under whatever that program is that you're deciding to use it on. Excellent. Um, one, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, um, unless you have another one, there's a couple questions that were, that are posted in the chat that I think we can, we can yeah. pick up. If, um, yeah, I was, I was actually going to start with the, uh, the last one that just rolled in here. So will you show later how and where to report projects if funding is less than $10 million and you choose to take the $10 million allowance? Uh, the answer is, I believe so. But just since we're talking about it right now, when you sign to the, the federal treasury portal on the left-hand side, there's about five or six different categories you can choose from. 
you're supposed to walk it through in order as listed. But one of them, I believe it's called recipient specific. That's where you make your determination whether you're taking a calculation. And if so, you lay it out or you select that one time lump sum $10 million allowance. Once you do that, you then put in the type of government services you are providing. Then you need to go back up to the expenditure portion and create a project or multiple projects if you want to distinguish the types of um, programs or type of projects you're running through that revenue replacement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Sean. And when you go in and put in the actual projects, there'll be a section that says projects, and then underneath it, it says subrecipient slash um, contractor um, or beneficiary, and then it has another section below that. Um, and you then have to basically link the project to the actual expenditure piece and then the subrecipient piece. For the revenue loss, it actually, that's one of those, when you add the project and call it revenue loss, you're going to tell them how much the budget is for that project and then how much um, is obligated and expended through the date of this. Um, that's where you stop. You do not have to do the subrecipient or contractor information for revenue loss, and you do not have to link it with in that other expenditure area. All you have to do for revenue loss is fill out in the project, um, the project area. Now, the caution being currently, it says currently Treasury is not requiring you to fill out those other areas. So they're covering themselves so that in the future they may require you to also report on those items. But currently they're not. Um, the other thing to note is that because this has come up for some of our clients who are quarterly reporters, well, what if I already reported a project? for my 1231 report under category 3.1. But now I'm able to call everything revenue loss and it's much easier to report on. Um, can, can that be fixed? If it's also eligible in another category, can we still call it revenue loss? Because revenue loss has a lot less reporting requirements. And the answer is absolutely yes. In the actual user guide, it even says you can reach, you can change the expenditure category um, for a prior submitted project to cover it under revenue loss if, if you want to um, because of this additional um, amount that you're now able to um, call as revenue loss. So what we've been recommending to clients is go with the path of least resistance. If it qualifies in multiple categories, put it under the category that's the easiest um, and has the least amount of administration and um, reporting required. Um, and so that would be if basically anybody under 10 million call everything revenue loss and report it under the specific projects under revenue loss. Um, now, obviously you're not gonna do that if you say receive 50 million, and so you only have 10 million in revenue loss. Um, obviously you're going to want to report certain things in other categories that are eligible and reserve, reserve your revenue loss categories for those that aren't eligible anywhere else. Um, so a little, a little bit of kind of pre-planning, pre-thought on how you wanna do it and limit the, um, you know, your, a exposure to being having to prove out the category you did it to, and then also just the administrative burden piece. Yep, and, and Hannah, as you as you prep this next question here too, I was working with a client the other day who had uh, they had COVID nineteen testing, they had a vaccination site, but they only received about six million dollars. So instead of him filtering through individual projects and going, okay, uh, category one public health, and then one point two COVID nineteen testing, and doing another one for one point one. Uh, you know, COVID-19 um, uh, vaccination sites, we told them, just do it all under revenue loss. You can do it that way. It's less reporting. It's less onerous on you, um, considering they didn't have a, a separate opera grant manager. Um, yeah. So that, that actually brings up, and before I, because the other uh, question that's sitting out here is not related to revenue loss. So I just want to add in um, with that, that conversation is, um, as we mentioned, at, I think at the very beginning, when you're doing a project, so one of the questions someone will ask me is, well, what is a project? What do you define as a project? Um, for the treasury, a project has to fit into one subcategory. So there are 83 subcategories of um, ECs. There are 83, so it can only fit into one. So if you have a project like Sean was saying, a client who had, is doing um, vaccine clinic and then also testing kits, if they didn't have the revenue loss as an option, that would be two separate projects because it's two separate categories. So when you're talking about projects within revenue loss, it's really what makes sense to you internally for being able to track and monitor the budget and for the approval processes. So um, that's really an internal decision because you could in theory put 
all of it into one project under um, capital expenditure, but for management perspective and monitoring and approval process, you may not want to do that. So you may have a different project for each department. You may have a, you know, you may determine to do projects, you know, on some other basis, um, whatever that makes sense for your internal administration and management of it when it's in that category. So we've probably um, covered revenue loss quite a bit there. And so I want to make sure and touch on this other question. This is a great question. Um, it says, we read that many capital expenditures have to, um, we read that many capital expenditures have to be inside of disadvantaged communities. What about park projects that are near the disadvantaged communities, but not within them? That's a great question. And that's actually come up a couple of times with some of the clients that we're working with. So it's not that they have to be within those communities, the capital expenditures, if you're going to do capital, whatever category it is, it has to be, that has to be eligible. So for instance, the park example, um, most of the, the, the experience I've had with that where they've been trying to put that in is for under that um, um, improving the neighborhood category under economic, that was under, was that under economic or, no, that's under public health, the improvement yep, of two. the neighborhood. So. Unfortunately, with that one, that specific category, it does need to be in um, a uh, economic, it, to qualify for an expense in that category, it does need to be in that um, impacted community. So it depends on what a, um, expenditure category the capital is related to on whether or not it, it has to apply to a dis, um, disproportionately impacted versus impacted community. So hopefully that um, make sense for that differentiation. And Hannah, too, isn't there a way that, let's say it's not right within the heart of a disproportionately impacted area, if you can carve out an area that is close by and, and do an analysis and say, well, because this part of the area is dis disadvantaged, then you can, you can do park work for that entire piece, or am I off basis here? So, I mean, if you look at it and say, okay, well, the vast majority of people that are using that park are part of that disadvantaged community. But this is where you go back to, I think Sean said, we're going to beat it into everybody, document, document, <laughs> document, and justify, right? If you can show and justify that um, the majority of people who use that park, while it might not be inside the middle of that community, but is close enough and has enough nexus um, attachment to that disadvantaged community, if they're the main um, users of it, then um, I think you could justify it under that category. It's just you have to be able to document and justify it. Right. Absolutely. So I know um, Allison behind the scenes, who you all you will all meet later for our reporting. She went through and answered some questions. Thank you, Allison. Um, but we might as well just go through them in case um, there's maybe further questions on them. Unless, Hannah, you have something? Well, I just to say, another capital one just popped oh, up. It said, okay. can you fall under the less than 1 million capital expenditure category and not have to provide a written justification if you provide funding up to 1 million for a project greater than a million? Oh, okay. So I think what you're trying to say is maybe you have a project that's being split funded. That's my take um, on it. So say you have a project that's uh, 1.5 million and your half of it is being paid for by, um, you know, local funds and half is being paid for art. But that's how I'm reading that question. Um, that is a great question. And um, I will say, I, I don't believe it specifies whether, um, I don't know, think it specifies, but let me go look at the actual language. Um, my yeah, take on it would be what you're reporting to the treasury is only the amount of the project that's from ARPA. And so if it's 750,000, you're not reporting to the treasury 1.5 million as the project, you're reporting the 750. And that, I believe they have it kind of smart in there that once you hit that you know, over that threshold, then you have to start adding that justification. So I think if, if it's within that category for the ARPA only piece of it, I think you um, probably won't have to submit that justification. You may want to have it in your own support just in case um, to be safe. I'm always like to be 
better to have it and not need it than to not have it and need it. Um, but it, I don't believe it actually specifies whether um, when you have a project that's split funded. Right. Hannah, my take is similar to yours, too. It, it just the ARPA portion of your reporting, then I would say no, but always have some backup just in case you need it. Uh, Hannah, do you want to go through some of the um, other questions that were previously discussed? Sure. Great. So one of the questions we got early on was, can you give an example of the 83 subcategories and how uh, to apply to a project? So as Hannah and I talked about, there are ultimately seven, we'll call them ARPA buckets or main categories. Then within there, uh, I believe it's uh, the first category has 14, the second one has like 28. So depending upon where they fall, that's where you find those additional subcategories. In each one, if you read the reporting guidance, may require additional programmatic data. Um, so it is important if you are doling this money out under a specific expenditure category that you do utilize that reporting guidance so that you can see, ooh, does this category require some additional um, type of information versus another one? If you're picking between buckets and you think one might be a better fit than another, um, I would certainly pick the one that has less reporting to, to do. Yeah, and if you, um, we have a lot of links in here to various um, resources that you can go to. The, the Treasury site, they'll have an updated and they keep an updated um, reporting reporting guidance. And in there, they, they list out the entire, um, all 83 uh, categories and they also will specify what additional um, information is gonna be required by each category. For instance, like, um, the rehiring of public sector staff, it asks for, they want you to um, report your FTE count, um, how many FTE are being covered by this project. Um, different ones, like some of the aid to households, they will ask for how many households um, is this program covering and various information like that. So it's, it really depends on the subcategory. Um, and I think actually when we go through the next session, which is the, um, the portal demonstration, you'll be able to see some of the um, the variation of, of how um, picking the subcategory and the eligibility um, criteria will tell you what kind of information you need. So learning those rules, figuring out upfront when, so when a department comes to you and says, hey, can I do this under this um, ARPA program? The first step you need to do is, okay, well, let's, where would it be eligible? Let's look at those rules for eligibility. And then, okay, what kind of information do I need to gather up front? Because remember, Sean and I both recommended to you that you get all that information up front because you don't want to wait and have to report on it a year from now and say, oh, I don't know what the permit number is for that project, or I don't know how many FTEs this was covering and trying to go backtrack to that department to get that additional information. So figuring out what those um, required programmatic uh, reporting items are up front is really important. In order to do that, you have to determine up front what category it qualifies under. Yep. And I also had another older question here that actually came from someone in California. So if they're on this webinar, uh, hello again. But they asked, um, who is eligible for applying for ARPA funds? So essentially, can a private organization receive funds from a, a state, a county, et cetera? And I, I know the answer at the time, and I'm pretty sure this holds true. Uh, you know, ARPA funds were distributed to your local and state governments and that ARPA does not necessarily authorize Treasury to provide funds directly to nonprofits, and that's why you guys didn't receive them. But you can right. certainly apply for them through your local city, town, county, state, if they're running a program um, that would benefit you or your, your members. Right, absolutely. So whatever jurisdiction your nonprofit or um, uh, business or household is, that's the jurisdiction jurisdiction you will go to for, to apply the funds. So one of the things Sean mentioned with the, um, I think it was 7.2 category, which is where they can um, give it to a, a, a lower, you know, a, a different form of government, has to be within your jurisdiction. So for instance, if a county is going to give funds to a city, that city has to be within that county um, and so forth. Like a state would have to give it only to cities or towns within that state. So um, as a sub you know, basically you'd be either a subrecipient or a beneficiary, um, you would have to go to one of the entities that you're within that jurisdiction. So it, what, the town, the county, or the state that you're within, though they would have to provide those programs for you. You cannot go directly to the treasury and request funds from the treasury. 
Great. Thank you, Hannah. So the second question that I think was already answered um, talks about, can we talk more about the external recipients and monitoring and risk assessment? Um, because of the limitations on the time for this particular um, session, we don't have time to go into that. However, in that uh, those closing and resources documents, there are several links to various webinars that um, we have on the CLA's website. There is one for risk assessment. So, um, and we went into quite a lot of detail specifically for subrecipients, um, both from the um, aspect of the ARPA grant and then also for the single audit um, requirements. So I would encourage you to go and um, look, you can, you can download the documents from that presentation. You can also watch the video. So um, let's see, are there any other kind of common ones? Um, Uh, we did talk oh. about the we did talk about the written justification. So if it is under that million dollars for capital, you don't need written justification. Uh, but I think as Allison pointed out, you know, make sure you do your own procurement and you document it. Right. Yep. Um, one note that is on here that I think is important for everybody to know: um, someone asked, "Can we get a link to this recording emailed to us?" Um, this is going to be on the OPR's website um, in a few days and. Um, available to anyone from, from that site. Great. Hannah, were there any other questions or, or uh, common questions we get that we think should highlight over the next uh, two minutes here? Um, I mean, I think just kind of to wrap it back up to the planning from the beginning, um, kind of internal controls, best practice, um, at the beginning when this funds first came out, I think a lot of people were scared, especially the smaller cities and towns who are not used to getting direct awards from the federal government and having to report directly to them. Um, the communities that have never done a single audit before. So there was a lot of um, hesitation. I actually believe it or not heard some communities saying, I don't want the money. Can I give it back? Because I don't <laughs> want to deal with this, right? Um, so I think the important thing there is really to have them set up um, a good process up front. Have a team who's reviewing these. This, um, both this and the CARES funds, which we mentioned earlier, are very unique in that um, they cross almost every department within your organization, uh, where most federal grants are going to be very specific to a department or to a specific need. This one is so widespread that you need to have um, like a good example of kind of this pre-planning and internal controls is uh, one of our clients who actually struggled with the CARES aspect because, you know, they were one of the ones that went overspending because everybody, every department just kind of went off and spent. Um, what we did with ARPA was they, we set up from the beginning, a um, they did like a, a formal application process for the departments to use. They wouldn't set up any accounts or budgets in the general, in their, um, in their uh, uh, financial system until they went through this process. They had a team of major of kind of some of the department heads um, who are kind of most impacted by the pandemic, right? So they had like the fire chief, um, the uh, town manager, the finance person on there, you know, a few of other, um, you know, like the DPW director, things like that, that they would have get together and review those projects together and really talk about where do we see the most need? Which ones do we have? Um, because many of these communities, they may have gotten $8 million in funds and they may have requests of $15 million. So then you have to go through and prioritize it. So I think that's where you have, if you have like an ARPA team or um, whatever you wanna call it, who's really looking at it holistically from your, your community's um, perspective, well, what's the most important and how do we prioritize these? And then making sure that the departments are doing their due diligence of getting that information out front. I think that's, if you get anything out of this, I think that's one of the most important things to think about is just really getting that documentation and pre-planning before you start spending the funds. Great, thank you, Hannah. I, I think now everyone is sick of us hearing say that, so we're, we're good. <laughs> and um, we're right at time, so. <laughs> I was gonna say, perfect timing. So we're gonna roll into a 15 minute break. So please return at 11.05 and we'll kick off our next section. Thanks everyone. Hi, welcome back everyone. Um, thank you for joining us again. 
Um, shortly, we're going to be viewing, or you're going to be viewing, a demonstration of our ARPA portal solution. So <clears throat> just a little bit about on the, the background of the solution. One of our clients, um, a larger county out here in Massachusetts, um, basically came to us uh, early on when they found out they were getting ARPA funds, and they had administered their own CARES funds, uh, and obviously found it pretty um, tedious with a lot of sub-awards, um, applications coming through, the actual awarding and sub-recipient monitoring and risk assessment that came with it. So for ARPA itself, they wanted, um, again, significant help in, in reporting, uh, determining eligibility, um, making sure that all the rules and regulations were followed. So essentially, uh, you know, they didn't want anything to do with ARPA. They wanted CLAs to help with it. So in order for us, CLA, to not be overburdened with administrative uh, work and, and paperwork, uh, we worked with our digital solutions team to come up with this ARPA portal. And what this ARPA portal does is that it will help you, uh, again, keep all your documentation uh, aligned in, in a central repository. It can be used for eligibility review, project submittals, reporting, um, and also quarterly reporting or annual reporting um, if you're a direct NEU. So um, with that, we will turn it over and hopefully start the video uh, in a few minutes. Thank you very much. Karen, if you wouldn't mind uh, going ahead and rolling it. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me today and allowing me to give you a demo of CLA's ARPA portal. Uh, just a brief history of how this is developed, and then I'll walk you through the solution itself. So a county here in Massachusetts ultimately wanted CLA to review projects for eligibility, uh, subrecipient monitoring, reporting, you name it, the, the full gamut of what uh, ARPA would entail. And as I'm sure as most of you are aware or are becoming aware, uh, it can be a lot of work. So in order to streamline that task, our digital team and our state and local government team went to work on building and designing what you see in front of you here. Uh, this is our demo site, but if you wanted to see a live actor portal, uh, we can certainly supply you with those names. And I'll also just briefly scroll over to a couple tabs here just to show you. We have, um, we've got NorfolkCountyARPA.com. We have PlymouthCountyARPA.com, which was our original. And also BristolCountyARPA.com. These are all counties here in Massachusetts that have signed on to, to use our portal. So as we go throughout this demonstration, you're going to hear me say uh, customization and flexibility a lot, because that's what this site is designed for. Even though ARPA as a whole should follow the same programmatic data and guidelines, um, you know, you, a city, town, county, region, state, whatever, um, they want something special added to your portal or some kind of customization that another may not want. So as a starter here, we've got our banner up top or our logo, excuse me, and also our banner. Totally customizable, as you can see, from one county to another. Further down below, we just give a brief welcome to the portal and what ARP is all about. And then we've also laid out some tiles here for eligible uses. So these may look very familiar to each one of you, um, as these are the standard ARPA buckets, if you will. You can move these tiles around if you so choose. You can put these in different orders. You can get rid of tiles um, if you don't want to make one of these specific categories eligible to what you want. Following that, we've just listed out some more information, perhaps a terms and conditions um, for these applications. Perhaps you have a grant agreement and you're going to subaward some of these monies. We also have some information below on the ARPA program itself and also some helpful, useful links. So if this were a live site, all of this from what you are seeing is available for the public to see. You know, anyone with a computer, access to a URL, you can see what I can see right now. And if they wanted to learn more about exactly what is infrastructure water sewer, they could click on the tile below or they could click on the drop down up here for templates. And they can see, OK, what is water sewer infrastructure? What does the final rule talk about when it comes to this type of project? What are the subcategories? Um, what do they include? How are they eligible? Et cetera, et cetera. So it gives the maybe, you know, Joe public a good insight into what ARPA is without reading the 430 some odd page final rule 
or reading the most uh, up to date reporting guidance, which I think is over 100 pages now too. So right now, this is what they can see unless you have access to the actual portal. And in order to gain access, access to the portal, it's a two step process and is controlled by you. Whoever is the owner of the site. So in these cases I showed earlier for the actual counties, Norfolk, Plymouth and Bristol, they told us who they want allowed access to the portal. And what they did was they wanted two individuals per community or sub recipient to have access, which again is customizable. You can have more, you can have less. It's, it's whatever you, you think is best. So in order to give someone access, again, it's a two step process. One is that you would tell CLA that we would get you provisioned behind the scenes in order to access the portal. After you're provisioned, you will then get a special invite to this portal where you were able to sign in and redeem a token so that you can now get into the portal itself and start creating applications. So since I already have that access level, I'm going to click on sign in. Click on sign in again. Now I have a much more wide variety of items I can look at, right? So we already had the home screen, we already had templates. But now you have a support, a support tab. So the support tab can be whatever you want it to be. So for this particular example, it was a uh, the treasurer for Plymouth County. He wanted all general ARPA support questions to run through him. So if it was a department um, of the county or if it was a sub recipient of the county, Tom wanted those questions to come to him. If it was something technical with the site, someone's having trouble um, submitting an application or not understanding an application or, or didn't understand how to where they would see their applications, then we have someone assigned from CLA state and local government team to help you out with that. What you'll also notice too is there's also a My Applications tab now and a My Reports tab. We'll get into those a little bit later. But first, let's go back to our home screen. So Earlier we saw when we, when we clicked on water sewer, you could see all the information that would be made public where you could read up on it. But now there's also a start an application section here. So depending upon your level, the way the permissions are created in the background is that there's basically a creator profile and a certifier profile. So we're actually going to walk through an actual application and we're going to click on economic impact for this one. And again, CLA has updated this from the interim final rule to the final rule to the fighting final rule of reporting changes. Um, as you can imagine, with a project of this magnitude, there has been a lot of changes from the feds um, starting back in, gosh, was it last May already? Um, getting close to a year ago when this the opera program came out. So we're going to scroll down here and we're going to start an application. Everything on this application is required by the feds. So what we CLA did is that we scrubbed the final rule and we scrubbed the reporting guidance so that anything you could possibly need or want to report is built in here and there's logical uh, edits in here too. So that if you were to click from one program to another, you shouldn't be missing any information. There are prompts in here so that you understand what's required depending upon the category you select. We also have um, some great little hyperlinks here, you know, better defining and explaining what actually is evidence based, what is project demographic distribution, right? Because some of these subcategories have the little asterisk or the little carrot, and they basically say, if you select this subcategory, we're going to want you to report on if you're using evidence based intervention or project demographic. Doesn't mean you have to use it, but if you do, they want to need to report on it and want to know the dollar amount. So let's drop down to one of the subcategories here. And I want to show you again the logic that's built into some of these applications. So if I were to select, say, 3.2 here, and all of these, the, the numbering system aligns with the final rule uh, reporting. So this may look familiar to a lot of you. And we're going to click on rehiring public sector staff. When I click on that, of course, you couldn't see it, but it pops up different logical questions that, that come up here. And again, it's all built from the final rule guidance. If I were to click on another one, and let's say, uh, let's go with tourism, right? You can see here the questions have now changed. It wants to know it has an aid to other industry questions. It has a sector of employer. 
It has a purpose of funds. Why are we asking these questions? It's because the final rule wants this programmatic data. It's required for it for when you actually report to the feds. So I'm going to click back on my 3.2, Rehiring Public Workforce. And you can see here some of those questions now disappeared, but we do have an FTE question that popped up. So let's run through and let's actually test one of these. Call it town rehire. Anything with an asterisk you see here below will be required. And we'll just do test data. Amount being requested, let's request uh, $150,000. Is this a capital project? No, it's not. If it was, if I clicked on yes, now this changes to required field. Once I go back to no, it's no longer required because it's not a capital project. Let's say I forget to fill out these other um, fields here and I go to click submit. There's logic built in here that informs you, oops, you missed a question or two, these are required in order for you to submit the form. So I'll go back down here. And again, we're just doing a quick test, so we'll just type in some wording. How many FTEs this is going to count for? Let's do two. That'll be at 75 grand each. And yes, I've read and certified that I've read the verbiage above. And I'll go to submit the application. As part of submitting the application, I've gone through and I've answered all the questions for the application. And what will happen next is that you'll actually get to attach files too. So say you want to attach some kind of GL report, maybe a vendor invoice. In this case, since we're hiring FTEs, right? Maybe it's some kind of job description. Maybe it's some kind of salary table. You would just go to choose files. And I just have a random Word doc here that we'll attach. So we have that attached right here. We'll click on next. So if I were the creator approval, and that's what I had uh, the ability to do, I would be stopped right here. The creator can enter in an application, but they can't certify it. The certifier role would then sign in, come to this page here too, where the terms and conditions are already built out as part of this application. So it pulls through my uh, entity or perhaps department. It pulls through the amount that we asked for um, and all the terms and conditions that are applicable for this program. And at the very end, I would click on yes, the yes, of course. I have read and agree, and I will sign my name, and I will submit. Scroll back down below. Successful. So what this does now is if this has created a record of someone's, again, whether it's a, it's a department, a subrecipient, et cetera, of what they're looking to use ARPA money for, how it applies to a specific category and subcategory, and that yes, now up front, I have all the programmatic data that I want that's required by the feds. Um, you know, I don't know what role you are in your city, town, community, et cetera, but there has certainly been a lot of turnover um, throughout the past couple of years, and if anyone's been involved with CARES too, if you are trying to get information at the end of a project, uh, it is certainly challenging um, due to people retiring, turnover, um, you know, changes in rules, et cetera. So getting all this information up front uh, certainly makes your life a lot easier. Uh, trust me, I've been in the same boat <laughs> as most of you on the call. So great, Sean. I've now gone through. I've created my application. I've certified it. I've submitted. What happens now? This is where the my applications comes into play. So say you were uh, a department within a town and you want to see what your status was here. You could see all the individual applications that were created for your department. In this case, we have it broken out by municipality. So ARPA 1037, this was a automatically generated number that goes along with my application type, my project name that we just created, the 150 grand, and one of the best parts, if you click on view details here, this everything we just did is now in a nice, easy, printable page for you, including your submission details. You could click back here and view your attachments. So there's that Word doc I created. We'll go back to the actual application itself again. 
So again, submission details, municipality, here's your terms and conditions. Here's the actual application that we just walked through with all the information and all the responses. So that if and when you needed this for, let's say, your external auditors, maybe your internal auditors, uh, or maybe your grant manager, you could click print. You can print this as a PDF, save it on your server. You could click it, uh, print it to your printer and save it in some kind of audit box or audit folder, um, whatever you see fit and how you want that to work. So as a former auditor myself, I would have loved to have had this back in the day, right? If someone was working on some kind of grant and there were applications involved and if I came and said, but how did you determine that this project was eligible? How did you approve this project? It's all built in right here. And let's walk this back again to my application section. So you might be wondering, that's all well and good, Sean. What are these application statuses? What do I have to do to kind of get these projects approved? This again comes back to customization and flexibility. The way it's working for this demo site is that there's actually three levels of approval. So there's level one, level two, and level three. You can customize this, you can have it however you want. So maybe internally, you want two levels of review. Maybe you want level one to be your grant manager and your grant manager is reviewing it for eligibility. And then maybe your level two is your finance department to make sure that yes, they also concur that it's eligible. Maybe you want your town manager, administrator, mayor, whoever to be the final approval. So that when you go through those approvals, you ultimately do have an approved application status. Now, the way this works is that it's all run through Microsoft Workflow. So this is what happens. When I actually approved and submitted and certified that application, the level one reviewer will get a workflow email just like this, where they have three options. They can either approve the application and you can type in a comment and submit it. Again, all going through workflow. No one's sending emails back and forth. It's all done through the system automatically. Maybe I want to reject it. Maybe myself as a level one reviewer re review the application and said, yeah, you know, I see where you, I see where you're coming from, but I really don't think this is appropriate uh, under ARPA. I don't think it really qualifies for this category or subcategory. You know, ultimately, I want to reject it. Or you could send it back for the individual who submitted the application as it needs more information. Maybe I do agree that this is ARPA eligible, but maybe I think you have the wrong subcategory with an economic impact. So I want to kick it back and give you the chance to open up the application again and either change the subcategory. Maybe I uh, I wanted your description to be a little bit more, right, and pro provide some more context. I could send that back as needs more information and open that back up to the, to the original uh, applicant itself. So all of, all of that is done through Microsoft Workflow. So at that point in at that point in the stage here, you can see from the uh, application submitter and also the reviewer as to where my applications stand and what they can do uh, on those applications. Something else we've added here too that you couldn't see before is my reports. So my reports, there's a couple different segments under here. There's a my report section and also a my document section. So for my reports, this is a great feature um, for you to not only help report to the feds, but also help subrecipient monitor. So I won't go through a full example from the My Report section here, but the way it works is that depending upon whether you're a quarterly reporter or an annual reporter, any approved application as of a certain period in time will get a report sent over to this section for completion. So I'm just going to pull one of these old test data we had here from 1231. So when we did this, we basically said, OK, this must have been a quarterly reporter because that first quarterly report was due at the end of uh, January. And that was for the time frame of 1231 and prior. So someone would have received a workflow notification saying your ARPA 1023 application was approved and now you have some reporting to do on it. So I want to click on the view details and just show you what that what that asks for and what that looks like. And again, the reason we're asking these questions and the reason why these are built in is because the feds ask this when you report, whether on a quarterly or annual basis. So it, it documents the expenditures, the current period and total to date. It talks about the project status. Um, it, you get basically four options, whether it's I think it's uh, not started, less than 50%, greater than 50% or completed. They want to know if it includes capital expenditure and how much. They want to know performance start and end date. And then again, all the information that you already filled out, and this was an older application, 
um, for the particular ARPA subcategory. So this is a great way to help monitor and with the help of our export button here too, once you do have numerous reports that you're reporting on, you can create an export and you can run one anytime you want by hitting the create button. It'll spit out an Excel doc for you. And this will be similar to one of those bulk upload templates that is available for the feds portal. But when you click on this and you develop and you develop an Excel doc here from all the approved applications, just give me a moment while this opens, it will pull in all the necessary information from the application and from the reporting field itself. So you have one document now that spits out all the information that you may possibly want to report on. So as an example, this would give you the uh, this could be this could again could be the subrecipient or department for internal use. If there was a DUNS number or EIN number, uh, award, the amount, description, category, so on and so forth. Here's your obligation amount, quarterly, budget, does it have capital, so on and so forth. So this myself, I helped use uh, when I did one of the county reports that was doing 131. It made my life uh, a lot easier because they, even though they only had about six applications that were approved and under the my report section, um, you know, why not create a nice easy Excel doc that pulls all this information from all these reports that were due? And uh, it certainly made my life um, much easier to fill out that report. Something else that is brand new is the my document section. So as an example, the items we've already gone through in the applications, those were application specific. Well, let's say you actually want to create and input something else for this full. Think of think of the solution as an entire, um, you know, database to get all of your ARPA needs taken care of, right? So maybe you have uh, an ACFR you wanted to attach, right? And so we even put that in here. We, you can do a grant agreement. You can do an audit report or other. So I'll select audit report. We'll just call it ACFR. Click submit. This will then allow you to attach an audit report. So I pull the state of California's back for. And we'll hit submit. So this financial report, it obviously doesn't have anything specifically to do with the actual application we just filled out. But let's say you do have a subrecipient. You're going to want this, right? You're going to be doing a risk assessment. You're going to be doing monitoring. You're going to want these certain documents so that you can go back and review them. So once you upload it, it becomes part of this file here. So you can always view the detail. And you can check out that attachment right here. So think of it as one stop shopping. Um, I have a client that's currently using this too, where they're going to input all their signed grant agreements. Uh, we had someone who wanted to put something. It wasn't it wasn't an application specific um, per se item, but they thought it was valuable for their own internal use. So they wanted to attach it. So that's why we created that uh, little other field under my reports. Um, I believe really that's that's the main uh, that's the main end of the demo here. So we've covered applications, how to submit. We've talked about how to certify those applications. We've walked through a little bit of the review process and how you customize that in terms of who from your um, city, town, county, state could be reviewing them and how you might want to customize that. We've talked about the my report section for a quarterly or annual report. We've talked about the export feature from the My Reports section. We've talked about the My Documents section. Um, and as something too, I just want to point out too is that that we here at CLA we are continuing to invest in more features and more capabilities, uh, and always welcome feedback from our current users. Um, we're even working on a dashboard, right? So that if someone wanted to see well how much money was spent under each one of these um, application types or subcategories, we're working on that too. Um, it's another great feature for a user is that you don't have to worry about updating the site for if the final rule becomes the the next final rule uh, a year from now or if reporting uh, categories change or reporting types change. Uh, that's what we're here for and we're the ones maintaining the portal for you. So thank you again for for watching the demo and um, appreciate you uh, listening. Thank you.
All right. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Thanks uh, for Sean for covering all the details of the ARPA portal. Um, now we're going to switch gears a little bit, but a nice uh, segue into the reporting, which I'm sure um, is on everybody's mind uh, with our April, end of April 2022 deadline um, for pretty much, I'm assuming, every organization on this call. Um, if you did not have your quarterly report previously through December, um, you will have it uh, now um, for a lot of the smaller, uh, lower tier your entities um, will have that now. So um, we will kind of walk through some of the features and things of the project and expenditure, re expenditure reporting that the Treasury requires. And then we will also cover um, a lot of the uh, kind of tips and tricks that we would suggest as you're kind of analyzing and tracking and setting things up from a general ledger accounting finance function uh, to be able to go through uh, with your reporting here. So um, that, that we'll, uh, we'll finish up in the next you know 29 minutes of this webinar. We appreciate everybody bearing with us for um, a lot of content here, but um, feel free to keep sending your questions and, and Hannah and Sean will answer those as best we can uh, while I'm speaking on this reporting. All right, so um, as I mentioned, project and expenditure reporting, um, this is something that's either required annually for um, you know the lower tiers, and we'll kind of cover what those tiers look like. It's all based on your total allocation that your um, city or town or state um, has received from the treasury. So in total, not just your first tranche of funding, but in total, um, it is based on all of that. For the, for the larger governments um, that did uh, receive, um, you know, the first couple tiers, if you will. And again, we'll have a kind of a chart showing what that is. Um, that is done on a quarterly basis. So um, that first quarter uh, was through December 2021. That was due the end of January. And now we're um, here on, you know, Q1 of 2022. Um, that reporting um, is through March of 2022 due at the end of this month. So um, hopefully everybody on this, uh, you know, webinar has already uh, been able to register and sign up through the portal, but, um, or excuse me, through the, the Treasury portal, not the CLA portal, the um, Treasury's portal. But um, if you haven't, there is different uh, requirements that you do have to go through. And, and I know um, a lot of the clients that we've been uh, working with and helping with this, I think the biggest hurdle is if you had turnover at your organization or you're not sure who has access to um, the Treasury information, um, that can be a little bit of a bear to track down and um, try to figure out who um, who has access and, and getting getting going with that. So if you haven't done that yet, you know, you have a couple of weeks left until the reporting's done. I highly suggest figuring it out this afternoon if you can, um, if you haven't figured out how to be able to log into um, the direct as, uh, access for the, the Treasury's um, portal for this uh, project and expenditure report that's due the end of this month. Um, the, the three kind of key, so number two here, you can see on the slides, the three key roles that you do have to assign at your organization um, is listed here. So account administrator, point of contact for reporting, and then authorized uh, representative for reporting. So those are really the key roles that the treasury has designated. Um, you do have to have someone assigned to each of those roles, but you could have the same individual assigned to multiple roles. So um, there's a lot more detail within the user guide that the treasury has uh, put out there and um, in some of the, the Q&A answers, I did send a link to that and we have that also listed in a lot of our um, resources in the slides too. But um, that's something you definitely want to get figured out is who has access to what, you know, what kind of segregation of duties are already built into the reporting. Um, but, you know, from an auditor mindset, I'm, a, I'm an auditor by trade as well. So uh, making sure that you do have someone different, ideally, that is um, you know, preparing the form versus reviewing the, the form and submitting the form, um, just kind of your normal segregation of duties that um, if you go through an audit every year, your auditors probably ask you about. Same sort of thing here is make sure that you do have um, separate people uh, performing the roles. Um, and even if you're a very small organization, you know, you can have a, a non-financial person, if you will, a mayor or the treasurer or someone like that um, help with that review because ultimately um, someone at your organization does have to take responsibility. So so, um, of course, there's an educational component to that and understanding what's being reviewed, but um, you do want to make sure you have those, those reviews um, in place. And then, you know, certainly assigning the role um, is, is key there, too. So some of the key concepts for reporting, and, and we've already touched on quite a bit of this when Hannah and Sean were going through kind of the, um, you know, the nuances of all the information within um, ARPA, you know, what's eligible, what's not, um, but they kind of do align ultimately, or, or the Treasury is trying to align um, everything uh, as, as it relates to how things are reported versus what um, you're 
you as an organization are really tracking and, and going through. So um, I, this is really information that's pulled out of the user guide that um, the Treasury has put out there, but it is something that we want to hammer home because it is pretty confusing and it's kind of different terminology than we're used to seeing, um, certainly from an accounting finance type function, if that's your role at your organization. You know, there's, um, there's some different aspects you do have to consider, some qualitative information, um, things like that. Um, so, so I do want to walk through those here briefly. So expenditure categories, I think we've beaten this up one up pretty pretty well, but um, that is a key concept. Certainly EC, as you see kind of the acronym um, being used all throughout this presentation. And then also you'll see that uh, within the Treasury's uh, reporting for this, um, you know, this end of end of Q1 of 2022. Um, but each project that you do set up um, does have to align to one single exped expenditure category. And those are that uh, the total of the 83 potential um, expenditure categories. So um, that is a key concept because you cannot have multiple expenditure categories um, to one project. So, um, you know, I think we, uh, it was either Hannah or Sean talked about an example of kind of what a project would be. And I'm just going to look at my um, cheat sheet here, the listing of all the expenditure categories. So um, one uh, example, you know, under negative economic impacts, assistance to households is one of those uh, uh, examples there. So, um, you know, example number, let's just say 2.4, um, which is household assistance, internet access program. So if your government was going to provide assistance and in, in helping, um, you know, certain households with internet access uh, due to, you know, all the, all the needs we have from a broadband perspective, that would be considered one project in one expenditure category. So um, just wanted to kind of give that quick example. You know, it might seem intuitive, but it is important to um, really, you know, get, get to that base level of project um, understanding and then make sure it does align to one of those expenditure categories. So the, the term project, you know, we've been talking about a lot too. Um, that's also a, a key concept here, and that's probably the newest concept of, as we've been talking about um, that is is big throughout all of the um, final rule and, and then certainly the reporting that the Treasury is capturing for, for all the organizations. So the way they define project um, is that first bullet here. So um, that's a group of activities that achieve a specific goal or common purpose. So um, the example I gave, you know, setting up an internet um, uh, internet access program for households, that would be, you know, one specific goal. They're trying to provide access to households throughout the community. Um, so that would be an example there. Um, I mentioned the, uh, what was it, 2.4 uh, is the actual expenditure category as defined um, by the Treasury. And then um, something else kind of on the flip side, if you will, each, each expenditure category could have one or more projects, though. So, you know, that let's say that again, because I, I think it's taken me five times to read this to, to really understand. So, um, you know, each project has to have one expenditure category, but under an expenditure category, you could have multiple pr uh, projects. So, um, you know, maybe an example of that is um, assistance to nonprofits. That's another one of the um, categories under negative economic impacts. And maybe you're doing, um, you know, a certain program targeted to a certain group of nonprofits, so um, social service organizations or something. And, and so that's going to be a specific project that you're planning to, um, you know, uh, basically give uh, resources to nonprofits through a program that you set up by your organization. Maybe uh, separate to that, you're also going to do um, nonprofit organizations. Um, I'm trying to think of another uh, example, maybe food banks specifically. So different food banks in your community, there's going to be a program targeted to that. So um, so there could be multiple, like I said, projects under, under one expenditure category. So that's something that, to keep in mind. Uh, one of the other things, certainly, that you are, I think we've talked about this quite a bit, but under projects, you do have to tra track the obligations and expenditures. And then also, if you have any sort of subrecipients or sub awards, if applicable, um, you do have to track that level of detail as well. Um, this last one does talk about kind of how the how the different project components are organized. And I think the user guide does do a pretty good job on, on kind of outlining this too. Um, they do call them modules. And, and I think it was um, alluded to before Sean mentioned, um, I think it was recipient specific was one of the categories he mentioned, but um, you can see here that each project component um, you have to have entering in your project entry information, if you have subrecipients, if you have sub awards, and then expenditures. So it's kind of a, um, a process, if you will, that you have to go through once you actually go into that uh, reporting. So um, this is kind of 
uh, repeating what I what I just mentioned, but kind of to show you in the, the flow, if you will. So it's almost like a workflow that the Treasury has within their project and expenditure report. It does start with the introduction and, and bulk template uh, process. Um, you don't have to enter projects um, from a bulk standpoint. You can do it manually, um, but certainly if you have a large number of projects, I would suggest going through the bulk upload process. Um, we could spend a long time just talking about that, but um, did want to mention that there, there's an option uh, to do things manually or through a bulk process. You do have to go through then the recipient profile, so that's your actual organization and all the details there. Uh, project overview, um, as we've been talking about, you know, you need to have a description of projects and, and um, you know, some sort of numbering scheme and things like that. There's a lot of details you have to enter there. Uh, then you go into the subrecipient uh, beneficiary and contractor um, details if you do have any of those situations for any of your projects. And um, we could spend a long time certainly on talking about that, but there is some good information that the Treasury has put out in their compliance and reporting guide guidance, as well as the um, the user guide kind of contrasting what a subrecipient would be versus beneficiary. Um, it is very similar to if you're used to federal programs at your organization and going through um, the uniform guidance requirements, trying to determine if you have a sub, sub uh, recipient versus beneficiary versus contractor, it is a very similar process. Um, Subrecipient, really, the, the biggest thing is if you are using a third party, a lot of times a nonprofit might be getting money from a government, um, and uh, you're actually having them determine eligibility of individuals that are received benefits. So the subrecipient is almost more of a conduit um, to help maybe gather applications from households if you're rolling out some sort of program to you know, low-income folks. Um, and then they would be providing information back to you, normally in the form of some sort of sub-award agreement or IGA that you have with them. So um, there's kind of ongoing relationships, if you will, when a government has a subrecipient. On a beneficiary, that means that that ultimate you know, third party is receiving the benefit from that, and there's not any sort of ongoing um, requirements or things that they have to report back to you. So um, that's typically if... Um, you know, a nonprofit, you're just providing them some sort of grant because they had increased costs or they had to lay a bunch of people off or they reduced their revenue. You know, they're, they're, they're really the end user um, in that uh, help. So, um, again, there are a lot more within the Treasury rules, but I just wanted to kind of touch on that briefly there. Um, Subaward and direct payments is another screen that you would have to talk through. And um, I think we might might have uh, detail coming up, but really the threshold, um, as probably you're all aware, is $50,000 or more. It does have to be individually reported. Um, aggregate of amounts that are that are either subawarded or directly paid under $50,000 um, do get aggregated together. But you also have to keep a cumulative um, tally or tracking, if you will, of payments. Um, and if it does, you know, reach that $50,000 threshold after a couple quarters of reporting, you would have to report that detail. So um, keep that in mind. And then really the big one we've been talking about a lot is expenditures. You know, you have to provide all that detail. Uh, recipient specific information is another field. And then certification is finally the end, end part of uh, the reporting. So this is the the kind of tiers. It might be a little bit hard to, to read, but um, this is also from the um, all of the, the guidance that uh, the Treasury has put out, but um, I'm just going to look at the, the page I have here printed out in front of me because the, the one on my screen is really small. But you can see here um, tiers one through three, and so that's the first three here in the, the gray boxes. Um, if you kind of read the description and if your government falls into that bucket, um, those are the project and expenditure reporting has to be done quarterly. So like I said, the first one was you know through December of 2021. Um, now your second one is through March of 2022 and so on and so forth. So um, any of those tier ones, uh, twos and threes, you've um, probably had had you were somewhat the guinea pigs, if you will, of the January reporting. And I think a lot of good lessons learned we can all take from that. So um, tiers four through um, five and uh, five, they kind of recast this a little bit. So um, just as a heads up, this has kind of evolved as they've put out the user guides. Um, those are annual. So those are really the smaller governments that um, received a lot less. So you can kind of see at the very um, bottom here, any of the metro cities or counties with a population below 250,000 250, residents and then allocated less than 100, or, excuse me, gosh, 10 million, is that, reading this wrong. So less uh, than 250,000 residents and then 10 million or less as your total allocation, those would fall into this last bucket. And so that's that's really the smaller governments 
Um, you only have to report this annually, which this is this is your an, your first annual reporting here is your April 22 reporting, which relates to um, everything that happened through uh, through March of 2022. Okay. Um, so so that that's kind of like I said, a fairly brief overview of the reporting, kind of the layout, the the information that you'll need to um, gather, and then kind of the time period. Here's um, taking maybe a little bit more step back before we um, dive into some of the general questions we typically get for reporting. Um, but really the, you know, the general accounting treatment and reporting considerations, you know, it makes it hard when a lot of the time periods of the ARPA, ARPA fiscal recovery funds um, grant is a bit different than maybe your fiscal year end or maybe the other grants that you deal with. You know, a lot of times um, grants can be on a 930 year end or 1231 or 630 or who knows what year end. So um, it can be pretty confusing to really understand, okay, I get the you know, get the expenditure side, I get the pro, uh, program side, all the project details you have to track um, for the uh, reporting uh, from a federal reporting standpoint. But then what about my books? You know, what about my um, financial statements? Or if you prepare a, um, an ACFR, as, as was talked about before, or just basic financial statements, whatever your deliverable is each year, um, that can get a little tricky. So I think generally probably most folks on this call um, on the webinar, our 6:30 year year end, and uh, the local governments within uh, California. So I'll kind of try to try to frame it around that. But um, certainly, you have to interpret this for uh, what the situation is if you do have a different fiscal year end. So, um, so if you kind of rewind a couple years ago when all the CARES Act money came out and uh, coronavirus relief fund, especially, there was additional information that uh, the Government Accounting Standards Board or GASB released about kind of accounting treatment and how do you account for this and um, how do you recognize revenue, all the kind of um, very detailed nuances that we had to interpret and figure out for financial reporting. Um, they have not, so GASB has not done that for ARPA reporting and really the the um, the main reason, I think, is because they're saying, hey, we've already released guidance out there that covers this. And so um, they did kind of provide um, some, you know, Q&A, if you will, related to the CRF and CARES Act reporting. They have not done that for um, the ARPA fiscal recovery funds. And, and I don't expect that to come out either. You never know, but um, I don't expect that. So um, the good news is we have precedent here is kind of the, the takeaway. And so GASB statement number 33, uh, reporting of voluntary non-exchange transactions is really the Go to um, standard accounting standard that government should follow uh, related to this. And so, um, kind of walking through, depending on what type of structure that your government is, if you have multiple funds, if you have governmental funds and business type funds, um, if you have internal service funds, which are, are full accrual, um, just depending on kind of what your structure is, it could vary as far as how you record this. So, um, I'll kind of talk through the two scenarios, but just keep in mind that you would need to interpret this for. Um, your own organization and what kind of fund structure that you do have, whether it's modified accrual versus full accrual. So um, full accrual reporting, so any of your business type funds or, or other related full accrual reporting, um, the, you know, GASB 33 um, sets the tone, if you will, related to this. So um, you would record a revenue and expenditure related to your, your ARPA um, spending when eligibility requirements are met. And so what does that mean really high level when eligibility requirements are met? That means that you've actually incurred the cost. Um, so you've spent the money and it fits one of those eligible categories as we've been talking about, you know, 83 different potential categories. So um, just keep that in mind. That's kind of the trigger point, if you will, um, that you would recognize uh, those aspects. Under modified accrual or, you know, your governmental fund type reporting, um, it would be revenue when the eligibility requirements are met and the resources are available. So um, keep in mind the whole concept of revenue recognition and what um, your government's um, revenue recognition policy is. Uh, very high level, generally, um, that's usually 60 days after year end. So um, let's say you're a 630 uh, year end, uh, fiscal year end. Um, this might have actually happened to you all uh, last year. So, um, you know, you might have 
received your money in, in May or so of 2021, and that let's say you didn't spend that um, during that time uh, time period, um, and you you know didn't have any sort of spending as of 630 2021, um, you likely had shown that as unearned revenue um, back then if you hadn't any hadn't any sort of eligibility requirements being met, meaning you didn't spend or caught the costs were incurred, um, and th and that's really because of this GASB 33 concept with with revenue recognition. So um, the concept of unearned revenue, you know, very similar to maybe other grants that you have if you did not meet those eligibility requirements, um, that's something that you would want to keep in mind. Um, again, if you have questions on this, though, or, or trying to understand how to present this in your financials, definitely talk to your auditor or consultants or whoever you're working with um, to make sure that that is properly reported. Now, fast forward, you know, a year, uh, this, this uh, 2022 year end. Key milestones, just a couple um, quick things here. I think I covered a lot of this, too, but these are kind of some examples of the time periods with the, the reporting. So, um, you know, I, I kind of said this, the second quarter of 2021, um, which, you know, was last year, obviously, that first tranche of payments was most likely received by your municipality. Um, resources were available, but eligibility requirements were not yet met. And so that would have likely triggered an unearned revenue uh, situation. Identification of eligible expenditures, that's really the key of, of hey, did you actually incur costs? Um, as we've been talking about, it is a bit different depending on what tier of entity you have. So the larger ones, um, those were those are quarterly, and so obviously you had that January reporting, um, and then you'll be doing it quarterly after that. For uh, this reporting, the end of this month, for the NEUs, the non-entitlement units, and smaller governments, um, it is through 3-31-2022. Okay. Um, some of the common reporting questions that we've been asked just to kind of uh, wrap us up to the end to leave a few minutes for, for final questions. If, if any more uh, are coming through, we'll leave about five minutes or so at the end for that. But um, one of the big ones certainly is your schedule of expenditures of federal awards or CIFA. So for any governments that do um, expend uh, $750,000 or more within your fiscal year of federal funding, um, you are subject to a single audit, um, which we could spend hours talking about the single audit concept, but part of that reporting requirement is preparation of a CIFA. And so, um, you know, at what point do you recognize your ARPA fiscal recovery funds um, on your CIFA? And so very similar to kind of what we talked about already, um, but you would report that on your CIFA uh, when it was expended and meeting that eligibility criteria. One question we get really common, especially under the revenue replacement category, um, if you are going that route, you know, if you're going to take that standard allowance we were talking about of up to $10 million, um, or even just taking, you know, if you actually had real uh, revenue um, loss of a lot larger than that, if you had a lot larger of an allocation, um, you would recognize it on your CIFA. Uh, when it's expended. So you need to have real expenses. Uh, we were talking about, you know, you can't just sit on that money. You can't put it in a rainy day fund. Um, you do have to make sure you actually expend that on real expenses, even if you're claiming the revenue replacement um, category or allowance bucket. Um, so you would recognize that, you know, let's say you spent that on public safety payroll or something like that. You would recognize that and show that on your CIFA um, if you did spend that during that that year that you um, are under audit or reporting for your for your CIFA reporting. One of the other um, kind of variables, if you will, uh, different fund types. This is a common question that we get to is, hey, should I set up, you know, a bunch of different, you know, special revenue funds or something, um, separate funds to track my ARPA projects or, um, you know, what should I do? Um, I think just generally we... Um, we advise keeping it as simple as possible, not overly complicating it, but a lot of governments do want to set up a new fund for this as this is a pretty long term um, project, you know, several years out and, and all depending on um, different statutory requirements or um, requirements of your own government's board or city council or whatever you have. If they want to show that separately, that is something you can do and show that separate uh, in a separate fund. But um, some of the trickiness, if you will, if it wasn't set up that way from the beginning, it can get a little complicated if, you know, you originally had costs that you expended in your general fund, but now you're trying to move this into this new fund that you're setting up for ARPA. Um, you know, really, you want to make sure you're moving and matching your revenues and expenses for ARPA specifically. So that might be some back and forth inner fund type activity um, if you do have to kind of move that. So obviously setting that up from day one correctly is probably the biggest takeaway there. 
Okay, so um, to kind of wrap things up here and just leave a couple uh, a couple minutes at the end uh, for questions. You know, what do you, just generally, how do I approach this? You know, we talked about the CLA um, solution, the kind of one of the things that we've developed for our clients. You can certainly do this on your on your own too, but it is a lot to handle. So if you are um, you know, trying to approach this for the first time at your organization, begin with the end in mind. And so, um, you know, trying to utilize the capabilities of your general ledger of your accounting system is really the big takeaways. You know, if you can build in additional fields in there or add it to something existing already in your reporting modules, whatever you might have within your accounting system is really key. So, um, you know, tracking the projects according to those 83 potential um, expenditure ty types that we've been talking about. Obviously, that's something you want to keep track of. Um, there's also kind of a three layer approach that we kind of reference. So um, you also are gonna have natural classifications that you'll gonna wanna track expenditures for, uh, mainly on um, for your financial reporting. So you know how your, your different financial statement categories are that would need to be um, tracked for audit and financial reporting purposes. Um, you also have functional classifications for reporting purposes. And then you also have project costs, as we've been talking about, for the treasury purpose. So um, especially if this is subject to single audit, if it's going to be audited as a um, program by your external auditors, um, you'll need to produce all the expenditure detail and, and all this kind of detail to the um, treasury reporting. So just making sure you have all those audit records and documentation is really key. You will want to make sure you reconcile your project expenditures to what you're reporting to the treasury, um, because that is something that your auditors will have to audit when they're testing this program. Um, so you definitely wanna make sure that all reconciles. Um, and then if you do have any sort of unused or unavailable grant revenue, just depending on your funds structure, modified versus full accrual, all of that kind of timing aspect, you'll wanna make sure that you reconcile that too. So, um, so again, just some kind of, you know, quick tips there as you're setting this up or considering this um, for the first time, if you haven't gotten too far down your um, the rabbit hole of spending is, is trying to make sure that your general ledger um, does help track a lot of this information. So with that, um, we have four minutes. I almost was on time here for any last uh, question and answers. And I think Sean and Hannah will maybe join me um, if there was any, as I'm try trying to look here, if there was any um, while I was talking uh, let's see here. Anything off the top of your head, Hannah or Sean? I'm yeah, looking. yeah, Allison. One did come through here towards the end, and it's um, for for nonprofit grants. Um, is the government agency or contractor responsible for NGO single audits? Mm. And so, when when I read that, my interpretation is: if you, the the nonprofit grant awardee, you are not responsible for the single audit. It is up to the direct recipient of those funds. They are responsible for the single, single audit. However, you are responsible for reporting back to that direct recipient. And presumably, if the direct recipient is doing what they're supposed to do, um, they will be asking you for, for monitoring um, and certain information, whether it's quarterly, semi-annually, annually, um, et cetera. And I'll add that too, and I, and, and I might be reading this question a little bit more. Um, if you, if so, like let's say your organization is an actual nonprofit, so the government's passing money to a nonprofit, and that's considered a subrecipient. Um, that subrecipient, which could be a nonprofit, could be another government, could be whoever, um, and they they reach the level of needing to go through a single audit based on all of their total federal programs, they would be likely subject to a single audit themselves. So um, there's kind of added layers to that and it, it gets pretty complicated. So it's definitely something you wanna analyze and look through with your grant agreements that you might have, make sure that you're considering the right um, requirements built into that agreement. Certainly if you're the government, you know, passing money to these third parties, um, it gets pretty pretty complicated um, to figure that out. But um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. And I would say when in doubt plan for someone to be auditing this money, or <laughs> even if you're um, not sure what threshold you're gonna get to, because there's a lot of eyes looking at, um, you know, certainly this uh, ARPA fiscal recovery fund grant for many years to come. And so um, making sure that, you know, you really understand those requirements and, and analyzing every agreement is, is key there. Oh, great, like Allison. Anything else? Uh, just one more that just came okay. into, um, how do we get access to the application platform? So mm -hmm. I'm not positive this is CLA solution versus the federal portal. Um, I guess we can answer both. <laughs> sure. <laughs> right. 
So if, if you're looking for CLA's digital solutions platform, um, reach out to one of us. One of us can certainly get you on a call um, with a member of our team to talk about uh, in more depth how the solution may be able to better serve you, uh, pricing, all that good stuff. If it's the federal portal, um, it is ustreasury.gov, I think it is, but let me actually pull that up because I can't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, and the good news is they do have a lot of the links, I know, within the user guide as well. So if you know how to access that, that's always the place I have started um, if yeah, you're looking I, for the treasury. Yeah, I actually always Google um, U U.S. Treasury Portal Login, and then that pops, that pops you right up. But it is um, it's portal.treasury.gov if you're trying to access the, uh, the federal portal itself. Perfect. And um, just one real quick uh, blurb, you know, we kind of mentioned throughout all of this, CLA has done a lot of other webcasts as well. Um, so we have a link to a lot of those, just kind of anybody can access those, you can view those, there's articles out there. And then we do have several links to a lot of the treasury um, and revenue loss calculation information that's out there too. And certainly um, we have our contact information there. You're welcome to reach out to us. Um, but yeah, thank you all for your time uh, this morning and, and afternoon. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. And, and again, feel free to, to reach out if anything comes up. So hope you all have the rest, a uh, good rest of your day and uh, good luck with all this. Thank you, everyone.